Do you believe that there were government agencies involved in the deaths of your father and uncle? Clearly there was government agencies involved, not only in the death of my uncle, but the cover-up. How do you end up living with Larry David? Uh, Larry, <laughs> he has a lot of rules that he <laughs> expects everybody to know. You just announced that you were on Epstein's flight? Glenn had called my wife and said, we want to do an adventure this weekend. And I said, do you want to take the kids for us on? And we flew out. Great plane? No, it was not. <laughs> no, it was the election in Chicago fixed? Probably. What does you that know, mean, fixed? I mean, they found ballots in the Chicago River. They overthrew the government of Ukraine in 2014, which is really what this war is about. I mean, I knew Harvey Weinstein. I knew Roger Ailes. O.J. Simpson came to my house. Bill Cosby came to my house. You also knew you, good people. Yeah. We just I, I knew that, <laughs> but you don't know these people are swamp creatures until all this stuff comes out. O.J.'s innocent. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just said you lived with Larry David. How do you end up living with Larry David? Uh, he was... I recruited him to, uh, and him and his wife, Lori David, yeah. to, I flew out to Los Angeles to recruit them to be on the board of uh, the Natural Resource Defense Council. I was a senior attorney. It's, uh, it's, probably, it's the big, one of the two biggest environmental groups in the country. And Lori had a big interest in the environment, uh, Larry. Yeah, what actually, was Larry's I, interest? Uh, well, I, <laughs> yeah, she actually had, we, we had, we had uh, lunch. The first time I met them, we had lunch at, uh, at the Sunset Hotel in Los Angeles. And, uh, and Lori, the, the thing with NRDC is they, they didn't let you on the board unless you were the principal. So the wife of a principal could not be on the board, hmm. right? They, it had to be, you know, Robert Redford. It had to be that person. And, um, and Lori was the one who was driving this, and she wanted them both to have a board seat. Okay. And so she was talking about, uh, you know, that she really called called the shot. She was a very, very powerful yeah. character. Yeah, yeah. And she said, um, she said, I control the money. I write the checks. Um, I have two interests. One is child health, and the other is the environment. And uh, and then I heard Larry, who hadn't said anything, and uh, I I heard him say something. I, he said. He said, I only have one interest. And I said, what is that? And he said, it's Larry David. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it's it. honest. Did they both get board that seats? That was my first meeting with them. I, Did they both get board seats? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you met him then. You and got then we became friends. And then they, they had a house. They were building a house at that time in Martha's Vineyard. Right. And I had lost my home in, I, I had outgrown my my home in Hyannisport. Okay. Which is where we summered every summer. Yeah. So they invited us to stay with them. So we, we stayed with them for two and a half summers, and then we started taking our other vacations together. And okay. we went skiing every every winter. And, you know, we became very, very close friends. And then at that time, Larry was still doing Seinfeld. Yeah. It, and he had just retired, and then he decided to, he was going to go up to stand, back to stand-up comedy. Okay. <laughs> and he decided to make a, uh, a film yes. about his return to stand-up. Which was kind of ended up being like the curb pilot. Right? And that was the pilot. They didn't uh, intend to do a whole series. Yeah. And they were recruiting... Cheryl got recruited because they wanted it to be plausible. Yeah. So that, you know, they didn't want to use no Cheryl's actors. your wife for everybody watching yeah, right now. Cheryl's yeah. my wife. Yeah. So, and she plays his wife. Yeah. In the show. yeah, yeah. And the first pilot, actually, she was supposed to be Jewish. Oh, really? Then they changed that later. Mm -hmm. You know, and she became, she was a shiksa. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, um, are, are there any uh, weird house rules that Larry had when you guys lived there? He has a lot of rules that he <laughs> expects everybody to know. Okay, what, what are those rules? <laughs> well, I mean, one of the rules, and I've, I've talked about this before, but when I, I started this thing, and this couch really sucks you in. Wait till massages start. Oh, boy, <laughs> what? <laughs> um, but when I, when I, you know, I, I met Cheryl, he introduced me to Cheryl, 
at a time when both of us were married. And so, and there, you know, there was no, he brought her up. I was doing There's a big, no chemistry? Well, not, not any kind of, you know, of that kind of chemistry. You know, yeah. I like you. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It was, it was that. all proper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, Towing the company line, I like this. Yeah, but <laughs> it was, it was noteworthy enough. Both of us remembered the, you know, what happened that day, but... I, we were skiing up in Banff, and I had a, I did a, every year for Waterkeeper, which was my big, my environmental group that I, you know, co-founded and then built to the biggest water protection group in the world. Our big event every year was a pro-celebrity ski event. Okay. And that year we were doing it in Banff, and it was very cold. And he, so I would say, Larry would come every year, and I'd say to him, can you bring some other people? So he brought Cheryl and some other people. And um, and so we met on that ski trip, but there was, as I said, there was no like chemical reaction. Yeah. Six years later, we were both in, involved in a divorce and she came to another event at that time. And there was kind of an instant chemical reaction. But I knew that, um, Larry, because he does have these rules, and one of those rules... Like what? What are the rules? I need to know... Would be that he, I, I could not date his television wife without getting his permission first. So, <laughs> why? why? What? what is his logic? Well, you know, I mean, you watch the show, right? Yeah, yeah, but the yeah, show yeah. always has logic. That's the thing. thing. What I like about yeah, it... Yeah. Yeah, but and he, they all have logic. They're not arbitrary rules. Yes, They're that's rules a, that kind of everybody does know... But they're not written down yes, anywhere. Exactly, yeah. Yes. Whereas right. like some people are like quirky and weird and their shows are built around how different and weird they are. And they go, yeah, I'm just an anxious, weird guy. I feel like Larry's like, you guys are weird for not adhering to these rules that we all know make sense. Like yeah, he feels exactly. right and justified in everything his he does. Quirk is yeah, he I mean, that's a good way of character, characterizing his humor. So what is his justification for why you can't be with his it's just TV obvious work. that, you know, <laughs> that... Oh, it could he, affect the... Rela you might not want him kissing her on the show. No, no, no. It's, it, it, it was his, that he had initial claim to her, and since we're friends... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you think sexually? You think Larry was, like, into it, or what? Uh, I think he loves Cheryl. Right. And, you know... And I'll tell you what he said to me because I I came I, I at that <laughs> he called dibs right? yeah. 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 first right of refusal right there yeah. that, what did he yeah. say he so like, that, Man, Kennedy's see, always meddling yeah <laughs> <laughs> so that um, season was one that was a season which Cheryl wasn't in it he later you know it was after his divorce from Cheryl which was the, the way it happened was you know his that show would follow his life and it would predict his life so he wrote himself getting a divorce on that show and then that year Lori told him she Jesus. wanted a divorce yeah 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 I think he, and he, it, he happened, didn't that happened it was again. his outlet <laughs> <laughs> this is my dream world yeah. <laughs> and uh, the so he was shooting the, the year after the divorce he moves to New York to shoot a play, which is called The Producers. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So, but he has to move to New York to do that. So I flew to New York, and, um, and I went to visit him. He was staying at the Lowe's Hotel, and I visited him at 10 o'clock at night, and I... <laughs> I said, I need to talk to you about something. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, you know, I, I feel like... Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know how I put it, but I said I, I feel a lot of affection and attraction to Cheryl, and I just wanted to check with you to make sure that was cool. And he said, he surprised me, because I felt like he would be horrified by it. But he said, um, he said, she's the best human being that he's ever met. He said that she is beloved in the industry and that she is the only person in Hollywood that doesn't have a single enemy and that he was really happy for me. Now, when he talked to Cheryl and she said, do you think this is going to work? He went, eh. <laughs> 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 and then... <laughs> no, no, no. 
<laughs> to be fair, he, you, you didn't ask him what he thought about y'all's chances. Yeah, he was consistent. You asked what he thought about Cheryl, and he's like, yeah. she's the best. She asked what he thought about you, and he's like, exactly. Hey. So it was, it was true. He's, he's always he's honest in that way. Uh, but then he reenacted it. Uh, that moment on Curb with Ted Danson yeah, yeah. asking permission, and he yeah. says, you know, fuck no, you can't do that. Well, that's because that's what so he wanted I to know say. That's what he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> and when you guys were living together out the, at the vineyard, was it like, did he have rules about food or anything? Like, did you ever drink too much OJ and he had to like sit He's a shoes off guy, I assume. Yeah, like, no, I, I just he imagine. Would, I, he would, you know, um, he was always, well, one of the preoccupations he had, he actually gave a speech about this in another comedy event that I had, the difference between the Kennedys and the Davids. Okay. And, um, and he had a long speech of all the different okay. things that the Kennedys, you know, when they were kids, were, could not come in the house unless, um, until it was dark. So that we were locked out of the house in the morning and they said, don't come back till dark. And he said, the Davids were locked in the house all day <laughs> and were never allowed to go out because yeah. yeah. the world was dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. So he had, a, you know, he had a, a litany of those kind of things. But, and my family, my brothers would come over and visit a lot. And, um, you know, he was always... Uh, he, He's he's uh, he's the same person he is on the show, except a much more generous, kind-hearted version of that. Mm. And uh, anyway, it was you know really really fun living over there. Okay, uh, so many things I want to talk to you about today. I have all these crazy notes. Maybe I get there. Uh, first of all, there are people that are listening or watching around right that might not know you. Can you explain your voice to them? Yeah, so I had a very strong voice, in fact, unusually strong voice, till I was 42 years old, 1996, my voice, I got an injury, a brain injury, that caused my voice, uh, uh, caused this to my voice, and it's called spasmodic dystonia. Yeah. And... Um, it's pretty much stable, and in fact, it was much it's worse gotten better. than this. better. Yeah. So Cheryl and I went over about, I don't know, eight months ago, maybe three months before I, I uh, announced my candidacy, and we went to Japan, and they do this surgery in Japan where they put a, a piece of, like a, a bridge of, of titanium in my throat, hmm. and it helped, and then I started doing some therapies. And, uh, Dude, you, you know, it's improving. If you woke up from that surgery with an Asian accent, that would have <laughs> I said that. that? You know, I said, I don't want that happening. I told that to the guy. Before and, you uh, went under, you yeah. said? Well, they never put me I need me to pronounce under. R's. I'm RFK. They never put me under the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, you get in trouble for like Asian stuff. No, uh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I must have misread that. <laughs> <laughs> it was a misread. It was. <laughs> oh, good. He got you. Dude. He got you. Go, go, go. But anyway, so I'm not going to go there with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good, good, um, good. But, no, you're our president. You can't be making these jokes. <laughs> I'll be making these jokes. Okay. So it's not the worst thing uh, America's done when to I Japan. Did this, when I did that <laughs> surgery, um, I, they never knocked me out. So they did the whole thing when I was awake because they had to test out a bunch of different voices on me. No way. Yeah, and Cheryl was in the room, but it, there was a lot of carnage that was associated with it, and she ended up having to leave. Mm. But she was listening to the voices, and they would say, okay, count in this voice, and they'd move the bridge. And I'd say, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and they'd say, do you like that one? And, um, and that's what happened. Is it so, laborious at all to talk? It's, um, I have to think about it, which, you know, I didn't before. But not I painful. have to do some action. It's not painful, but okay. it's painful for me to listen to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't listen to myself. Really? If I hear myself on TV, I'll never watch this podcast. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, because I just can't stand the sound of my voice. And I, I feel sorry for other people who have to listen to it, but I, it's all I got. Well, if you're president, point. we're going to have to listen a lot. I know. You know? I, a lot of people, you know, are worried about that. Yeah. Hmm. You can just I tweet. I see it. They say on the internet, I like everything about you, but I can't take your voice. Can't so we do auto-tune you? Isn't there like a... <laughs> there should be AI. Yeah. Uh, because we do it with singers. 
manners, right? Like they have these weird inflections and then we manipulate it and make you it You know, perfect. people people are starting to write me saying, I can fix you with AI or I can fix the way you appear or something like that. But every day I get somebody who says, I can fix your voice. And I used to try them all. Because <clears throat> I, you know, I'm willing to try sort of new therapies and treatments. But I don't have patience for them, so I don't. I, it's it's hard for me to stick with them over long periods of time, especially if I don't see quick returns. Um, and now I say to people, and a lot of them went to dead ends. Now I say to people, show me somebody with my condition who you fixed yeah. before. Uh, that's good. And so very few of them can do that. Actual question: Having to think about what you're going to say, does that kind of end up being a good thing in your no, position? No, because I'm not. It doesn't give me extra time. I'm having to think about. Uh, I better take a breath first mm, before I okay. start talking or maybe nothing will come out. Uh, but it, okay. it used to be with my voice that there were times, particularly early in the morning, if I spoke, I, I didn't know if anything was going to come out. Oh, wow. So, um, but so now it's much better. It's much more reliable. Yo, quick announcements. Los Angeles. I know a lot of you out there have been asking me to add another show. First of all, thank you guys so much for selling out the forum uh, and I have some uh, fantastic news. May 9th, Staples Center. I believe it's called Crypto or something right now, but we're still calling it Staples. Uh, Shane Gillis and I will be headlining motherfucking Staples Center or Let's Crypto go. Arena or whatever the hell it is. Thank you, my boy. Anyway, uh, you guys can get uh, tickets for that. Pre-sale starts Thursday, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Pre-sale code is CRYPTO. Go scoop those up. That's going to be wild. Um, get those before they are gone. That is going to be a... Uh, that's going to be a dope show. That's going to be a dope show. Also, the Life Tour, we added a bunch of dates. You guys saw it last week. Uh, if you didn't get those, get on them immediately. Uh, we are adding uh, a third show in Vancouver. Thank you guys so much for that. We added a bunch of other shows as well. You can go to theintershows.com and you can get those tickets. But Vancouver, we have added a third show. Thank you so much. And now let's get back to the show. You're, uh, you've done one of the craziest things ever, which is you just announced that you were on Epstein's flight. Like you're the only person I think that was like, hey, I was on. <laughs> yeah. Usually people were like, hey, you were on. And you were like, no, let me, let me just tell everybody. Great plane? Was it plane? Yeah. Uh, I, I, no, it was not. <laughs> First Kennedy, of all, baby. I don't know. I'm not yeah, going to impress him, know. right? He's no, I mean, it, it, it wasn't like a big plane. Yeah. Like, uh, I bet on Donald Trump's plane. Nice. Which is, well, it's like a 737. Yeah. It's, like, it's not like a little G6 or something yeah, like yeah. that. It's <laughs> wow. I love it. Holy flex, shit. Right? Just flex on him. <laughs> a little G6. Okay, but give the context, obviously, to the Epstein thing, because you basically yeah, got out okay. ahead so of the... What I, so first of all, I, you know, yeah, I'm in New York for most of my life. Yeah. So, and I you run into everybody in New York. I mean, I knew Harvey Weinstein. I knew Roger Ailes. I knew O.J. Simpson came to my house. On yeah. the, Bill Cosby came to my house. You also knew you, good people. Yeah. We just I, I, knew, I, I did know a lot of them, but, you know, you don't know these people are swamp creatures until all this stuff comes out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, OJ's innocent. Yeah, 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 OJ yeah, has done yeah. nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so, Wait, do you know something? <laughs> Okay, go on. So you're you're hanging oh, out. With so all these, anyway, these are your best I, yeah. So in 1993, <laughs> my wife, um, who has since passed away, Mary Richardson, she knew Glenn Maxwell, and I forget exactly how, but she knew she lived in England, and she, you know, she knew Glenn Maxwell, and she said to me, I, we we were going to Palm Beach to visit my mother over Easter. And she said that Glenn had offered her a flight. So we went on the flight and um, and we flew down there with them. And then we stayed with my mom and I, well, my kids were all on the flight. This is 93. <laughs> yeah, don't look like that. Yeah. Terrifying. That's yeah. crazy. I mean, in retrospect, yeah, that's crazy. I, I, yeah, but with them, they, my, I had very, very young kids. I don't know. Um, but anyway... <laughs> <laughs> they, <laughs> they made it worse. <laughs> yeah. They um, 
uh, yeah, I, the, the stuff didn't come out about him till I think 2006. 2006, yeah. Well, that's 13 years later. Nobody yeah. knew at that point. Yeah. And then sometime in the next year or two, I can't remember when, um, I did another flight with them because they had, they, Glenn had called my wife again and said, we want to do like an adventure this weekend. And uh, yes, Mitch. And I said, do you want to go fossil? I knew a paleontologist who worked on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Yeah. And I had wanted to go out there and do fossil hunting. And I said, do you want to take the kids fossil hunting? And what an awesome weekend and, activity. Yeah. So we flew out. We went to... Um, we went to uh, to Sitting Bull, which is the big you know, mountain that they've carved. We went to Rushmore, and then we spent a day uh, fossil hunting, which was really great. My my son found a skull, almost a perfect skull of a saber toothed tiger. But Epstein, at that sometimes time, you say things that my brain can't even comprehend, <laughs> yeah, as if they're so normal. You said I summered <laughs> in Banff. I, you lost me at Summered Inn or whatever. <laughs> the, the fossil hunt was crazy. Epstein on the fossil. Hunt? Was that the first uh, time he's well, looked for old? That's, a, that's the first time I spent time with him. <laughs> oh wow! And I um, and I I realized he was uh, creepy. Was he okay? Go. He got, and I it, I'll tell you two things that happened on that flight. First of all, when we got to um, when we got to Rapid City, there were two cars, rental cars, waiting, right, SUVs waiting for us to take us out to the fossil hunting. And he took one of them for himself, and then all of us were in the rest of them. Hmm. Hmm. And he didn't actually fossil hunt. He he stayed in that car, and then he would get out and be on his cell phone. When we were at Rushmore or something like that, and uh, and when we were fossil hunting, and all the kids filled up boxes with fossils, and, they, and we had a great time, but he was not a participant. And then on the way back, I was asking him about how to, how he made his money because I knew that he had been a teacher at Dalton School. Yeah, and he told me that. Um, that, and I asked him, and I knew then he was the money manager for Les Wexler yeah. who, on Wexler. the Limited. Yeah. Yeah, on the Limited. Yeah. So I said to him, how did you go from being a math teacher at Dalton School to, to that? So you, Okay, good, good. And he said that some Chinese people had, uh, um, had approached him who had been taken advantage of by American grifters and they had lost a lot of money, and they asked him to find the money for them, and he succeeded in doing it. And that was uh, how he had, that was the launch pad for his career. So that didn't make any sense yeah. to me. Yeah. <laughs> because it just raised 50 more questions, like how did the Chinese guys find you in, in, yeah. at Dalton School? So anyway, that, you know, when somebody's talking to you and you have a meter that is like, this doesn't make any sense. And he, he told me something else on that flight, which was, I said to him, I asked him about something about investing in the stock market. And he said, I don't invest in anything on the stock market unless I have inside knowledge. Hmm. So, and I had just <laughs> met him. And he was telling me that he was He's committing loose. federal crimes. Yeah. 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 Only uh, insider trading. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and then the plane landed in, in Chicago. We thought we were going down in New York. And it landed in Chicago, and he got off the plane. And there was a limousine waiting for them, or a Mercedes waiting for them there. And it had a very beautiful blonde, like very beautiful woman standing next to it. And he said, my, plane, my plans have changed. I need to go to Europe. And he got off our plane, and they took the, the Mercedes to another plane on the tarmac, and he and the girl got on it. And Glenn was sitting in our plane crying and never explained it. Um, but I just thought that he's a creep. Mm. Yeah. What do you think her involvement in that whole... I have no idea. I don't have any information. My kids... Did you get a vibe from her like you got from him? No, I didn't. So hmm. you see, sometimes- but I, I don't know. I mean, I also, I, I mean, I wasn't thinking about it. Of course, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I knew, you know, 
I felt like she was raised in wealth and privilege, incredible, yeah. on top of the aristocracy, and everybody knew her. Her father and, is Robert Maxwell. Robert Media Maxwell, Talks and then India. Robert Maxwell and her brother, who was the heir apparent. Robert Maxwell then dies in this very weird way off a, off a boat. Yeah. And in the Mediterranean, it could be suicide. It could be, you know, something else. So, um, and then uh, the brother then, and they find out, then his whole empire collapses. And it turns out that he's been stealing from yeah. the labor unions and the entire fortune disappears. Yeah. And Glenn then comes to the United States. You know, it's hard oh. for them to live here. And she comes and, and I think she, this. my impression was that, and I don't know, she was always wonderful to me and, you know, kind. Uh, but again, you, you never know about people. But it seemed to me that she was looking for somebody, you know, who to replace the father who had wealth, et cetera. And and then, you know, Jeffrey was the kind of guy who would test... Your loyalty? Your loyalty by, you know, continuing to push you to the edge from what I know about him now. So mm. I don't know much about what happened to him then, you know, other than what I read. It's not a big interest to me, but my kids were very, very smart and well-informed and not a conspiracy theorist like me, right? <laughs> yeah, One yeah. of my older kids said to me, he was definitely killed. Oh, who? And I was, it was Connor. And I said, and I was shocked to hear him say that because usually when I say to him things to him, like, you know, <laughs> when I say something to him about, he's skeptical of me. <laughs> right. So, yeah. and that's their job as kids. You yes, want yeah. to raise kids yes. who don't just believe everything you say. Absolutely. And I succeeded in doing yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> so, Easier for you than most. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, anyway, he's very, you know, he's very grounded, very well informed. And he, he said to me, it's Jeffries. It was definitely a murder. Yeah. So, because of the, the weird circumstances, there's too many weird yeah. coincidences. Follow-up question real yeah. quick about yeah. this. There's all these people that are kind of with Epstein a lot. You picked up on a creepy vibe from him immediately. Do you have any judgment toward a guy like uh, Bill Gates who's associated with him a lot? And either, do you, like, do, are you like, nah, you must have seen some creepy shit and looked the other way? Because I picked it up very quickly. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Especially yeah, I don't, after. you know, I don't, yeah. I, I try to stay away from that kind of speculation. Like, if you look at my book, Anthony Fauci, uh, I tell people what I know happened and what can be documented, but I, I never connect the dots and say, oh, he must have known or he was motivated by this or that. I try never to look in people's heads. But I did see creepiness immediately. I don't know. The other thing is, and I think Jeffrey um, immediately realized that I was not a, a, a target, that I was not, you know, I, oh, yeah, that I was You couldn't not, be an asset. He yeah. couldn't manipulate that I'm not going to, yeah, yeah. That I didn't have interest, that I was like, yeah. you know, interested in building Riverkeeper and, you know, yeah. so I don't know. Yeah, and and... Yeah, that's that's also interesting that you kind of I don't want to say checked him, but you were vetting him, like just asking him where the money came from. Mm. Yeah, I think immediately is like, uh oh, this guy might be able to smell something yeah, fishy going on. Here. Exactly, yeah. and he, he's not going to wow you with money. Yeah, yeah. he's not going to wow you with experience. Bitch ass G six. Yeah, out. exactly. <laughs> the answer to the question that everybody wants to know, Akash, what is your decision? Um, in this March tenth, man, this is this is very tough. In this March 10th, I'm gonna take my talents to YouTube and release my new special, Gaslit. YouTube, that was the conclusion that you woke up with this morning. That was the conclusion I woke up with this morning. Why? You know, I just feel it's gonna give me the best opportunity to, to grow, to expand my-, my No, 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 I, I mean, why is this newsworthy at all? I, I'm sorry, I, I, what, do you, what do you mean? You've been on YouTube for years. Well, yeah, but this is, this is my special, so it's special. Yeah, you already did a special on YouTube. It was Bring Back Apu. I, I helped you promote that. Yeah, but that, this, was, this is an hour, and it's an, it's an hour, that's this more time. This has been done a million times. I mean, your friend Andrew Schultz has a whole business model that's, around this. That's I, a good point. You know, I have the news to do, right? I have wars to cover. I mean, what makes you think that I have time for this? 
Um, does does it help you to know that there's this the money is going to the children? Does it actually go into the children? It, I mean, it will if I have a child. <laughs> okay. You know what I well, mean? Uh, thanks for wasting my time. Gaslit March 10th on YouTube because where else would it be? Guys, my special is coming out this Sunday, March 10th on YouTube. It's called Gaslit. It is the most important thing I've done in the 17 years I've been doing stand-up. Everything built up to this moment. I put every fucking ounce of my soul into this. I hope you guys love it as much as I do. Sunday, March 10th, noon. Please watch it. Please tell your friends. I'm so fucking grateful for all of you who made this possible. And I'm so happy to be sharing this. And I'm truly proud of it. And I hope you guys love it. Thank you. Gaslit, Sunday, March 10th on my YouTube channel. Please tell the world. Let's blow this thing the fuck up. That is on my YouTube, Akash Singh Comedy, Sunday, March 10th at noon. I love you guys. Thank you so much. Also, dates. We're not going to spend a bunch of time on that. But uh, thank you to everybody who came out in Greensboro. I didn't even really promote until, except for this and the day of the shows. And we still sold out two of them. So thank you. Also, Stanford, Connecticut, uh, March 8th and 9th. And then next weekend, Dania Beach. I'm going to be doing a little promo for this special so we can only do shows March 16th. Those shows will sell out. Hurry up and buy tickets. Uh, all those dates and more, akashsing.com. But most importantly, guys, Gaslit, thank you so much. I love y'all. You said that like, uh, you know, sometimes you have conspiracy theorist ideas. Based on what you've seen in your life, how can you not conspire? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, and I well, you know, but, but like, by the way, show me a conspiracy theory that I've had that is not either generally I, accepted or has not, like, no, I'm not demonstrably I'm, true. Yeah, I'm not giving pushback. It, it was a uh, yeah, it was, you know, I was told that I was a conspiracy theorist because I thought glyphosate, which is Roundup, caused cancer. Right. <laughs> well, then, you know, I won a $2.2 billion jury verdict on that three jury <laughs> Can verdicts. Can you explain what it is, Roundup? Roundup is... For us um, city boys? Yeah, Roundup is an herbicide. It's the most commonly used herbicide on Earth. And it had, it's the, uh, the active ingredient is glyphosate. It's made by Monsanto. It kills everything green except things, except plants that have been genetically altered to be Roundup resistant. Hmm. And so, you know, you have Roundup ready corn where the seeds have been altered so that, it, and you can fire all the farm workers who used to wear backpack sprayers and and spray the weeds when they were competing. To spray and, you, and you... Oh, and you saturate the entire landscape from an airplane with glyphosate and everything green will die except for the corn. Yeah. So now they have Roundup Ready corn, they have Roundup Ready soy. It, and glyphosate is everywhere now. It's in your ch kids' Cheerios. It's in the, uh, it's in the wine. Mm. It's in beer. Mm. It's in everything. But what we did, we sued on behalf of home gardeners and we had about in the end we had about forty thousand home gardeners who had gotten non Hodgkin's lymphoma mm. um, from uh, from Roundup. And the reason we sued on home gardeners is because home gardeners are very careful about chemical exposures. And if you, we could not sue on behalf of farm workers because farm workers are are exposed to everything, atrazine, neonicotinoids, all of this wide range of, and so you can't really, there's so Specify many which thing is actually causing the cancer, but with home gardeners, you could. Yeah, we, we could isolate it yeah. and we could say, you know, we get them on the sand and say, did you ever use another pesticide? Oh, no. Never. Mm. Why did you use it? Because they had a picture on the front of it that had a guy spraying with bare feet and his shirt off. And it said, safer than aspirin, safer than anything. You can drink it, you know. Yeah. And um, so uh, so we represented home gardeners and we, you know, we won, you know, we won a series. We won a, uh, $289 million in the first suit an African-American groundskeeper for his school in, in Northern California who had gotten it all over his body. He, he was getting it, he was carrying a sprayer that leaked and he was getting these postulating lesions. He called up uh, Monsanto and he said, could this be from the Roundup? And uh, they either didn't answer the phone or they told him no. Mm -hmm. And he kept using it and then they, you know, covered his whole body and he was dying when we tried and the that case. Is, uh, the massive accomplishment, I think to reinforce what Andrew was saying, is an idea of like, I think people will just kind of write you off as conspiracy theorists. I think his point is to empathize with like what you've seen in your life, your 
We say assassinated because it's not personal for us. Your dad is murdered. Nobody really understands what happened. Your uncle is murdered as the president. Nobody's really clear on what happened. So obviously a guy who grows up like that is going to see these theories and be like, yo, I'm not dismissing any of this because of what happened to me in my life. I think that's what you're trying to say. 100%. Right? Yeah, and I it's... think that's where it's like people can write you off as conspiracy theorists, but also empathize, agree or disagree with, of course, you probably would be too. Why wouldn't you be skeptical, especially if it's, you know, I mean, I don't know. Do you believe that there were government agencies involved in the deaths of your father and uncle? Yeah, I mean, clearly there was government agencies involved, not only in the death of my uncle, but the cover-up. And, the, you know, I'm an attorney. If I, not, just with the evidence, without any doing any discovery, with the evidence out there now that has accumulated about my uncle, Seth, there's over a million documents. Many of the people involved have made confessions um, including E. Howard Hunt, uh, David Adley Phillips, David Morales, uh, Charles Harrelson, Woody's father, who was you know yeah. involved peripherally in it, mm. in, the, in it, and many, many others um, who were um, who were involved have confessed. But also, there's just there's hundreds of thousands of documents that you know show what happened, and you have a sixty year. CIA effort to make sure nobody sees that. Okay, so can you tell us what one you think happened based on those documents and based on what those people said, and then also what the CIA has done to squash those? Yeah, voices? I mean the best evidence is that the, the you know the CIA was involved in a project to assassinate Castro, and in order to uh, promote that project, they recruited. Um, there was a there was a CIA station chief in Miami, and and you know the head of the project was a guy called Bill Harvey, who hated my father. My father and him uh, just tangled with each other from the beginning. And my father was attorney general, but he was also overseeing the CIA. And Harvey hated my father. My father extremely disliked him. And. Harvey was running the Cuba project, including the assassination project, and he recruited three big mob families to help him assassinate Castro. Santos Traficante from Tampa, Florida, and uh, Giancana, Sam Giancana from Chicago, and uh, Carlos Marcello, who was the Dallas and New Orleans crime chief. And um, these are Italian mafia families or Cuba? Well, actually, Carlos Marcella is of Italian descent, but he was Tunisian. He was born in, he's a very interesting character. My father once, uh, one point they deported him because he was here illegally. And he ran, he was a tiny little guy and he ran the whole mob family, the mob from Dallas to New Orleans. Wow. My father, at one point- the, Which mob though, the Italian mob? Or? Yeah, those are the three most powerful mafia families. Wow. And the reason they were involved is they all had casinos in Havana. Got it, got it, got and, it, got it, got it, And got when, it. when Castro, that was this big thing. In fact, when I've, I've talked to Castro, oh. I've met with him a number of times. Really? Yeah, and, he, and I asked him, you know, oh, are you getting capitalism in it back? And he said, yeah, we're going to get it, carefully bring it back, but never the casinos. Hmm. And, and the casino, because he thought that had corrupted the whole country. So this is interesting. So, so there's the interest from the Italian mafia families, because they're profiting off of these casinos. Mm -hmm. Americans are flying down there. They're spending tons of money in these casinos. They're extracting Oh, they were everything. making millions and millions on those casinos. So no. they're incentivized to get him the fuck out of here, so it's easy for the U.S. government. So they can, so they can go back and bring their hey, casinos back. I get it, I get they it, I get it. They want to turn into Vegas. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, so they, and and... Uh, Bill Harvey, the CIA agent, had a liaison to all of those mobs, and that guy was named Johnny Roselli. And Johnny Roselli uh, was actually murdered, I think, in uh, 73 when Congress reopened the Warren Commission. And uh, it's called the Church Committee, and they tried to, um, to, actually, Gary Hart, who I've talked to about this, they subpoenaed Johnny Roselli. Oh, he was supposed to come talk to the committee, and he never showed up. And then his body was found in a 55-gallon oil drum, uh, chopped into pieces. Ooh. 
exploding in Biscayne Bay. Damn. But he had also been involved in in a, a weird way in my father's testimony. Now, I always thought that my father, that Sir Ann killed my father. Can we give a little context to your father's death? Okay, your yeah, father was so what happened, my uncle, yeah. my father, in 1960, ran my uncle's campaign. He was my, you know, my, 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 uh, my grandfather, Joseph Kennedy, made a lot of money in banking and in owning, um, uh, a studio, one of the biggest studios. Yeah, he was Hollywood. making films. I didn't even realize yeah, that. He was a big filmmaker. They weren't good films, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were family films at that time, and it was like Tarzan, and but all clean, you know, that, that you could show in theaters across the Midwest. That was his business plan. It was, uh, it was part of RKO. My grandfather, after my uncle's death, my the CIA... Um, tried to smear my grandfather by starting this rumor that he had been a bootlegger. That's what I was about to ask. He was was, never a bootlegger. So this was, to me, common knowledge my whole life. I was like, yeah, the Kennedys made that money. And then I start doing some research on you and I find out that there was money made in alcohol, but it was through exclusive deals when Prohibition dropped. Yeah, he and Jimmy Roosevelt, who was the president's son, when they knew, because the way that they got rid of Prohibition (laughs) is you had to get uh, I think 26 states had to um, had to reject. Was it the 16th Amendment or 17th Amendment? The one that you know yeah. illegalized. It. So you had to have state by state adopt laws saying we we want to get rid of that prohibition. Yeah, and when it got close to the end, and they knew they were going to win it. My my grandfather and Jimmy. Roosevelt went over to Scotland and they bought Pinch, which was a very high quality band plan of scotch. And they took all the inventory and they shipped it over to warehouses on the Canadian border with the U.S. So it was ready to go. So the night that prohibition ended, they were shipping a high quality whiskey to everybody. But that's his only involvement Hmm. with it. Um, And then I think he sold that company later on for a lot of money. He he was conscience stricken about it. Oh, really? Yeah. He didn't think he should be, be selling alcohol, and he sold it not I for don't religious think, purposes or because it was just it's, it, it, yeah it was like a sin it was a you know it was a, a, a sin enterprise essentially what they'd call a sin enterprise and he didn't you know he he made a lot of statements about I, I don't feel good about this so he overcorrects and starts making family films which suck apparently but well i i don't good. think he was making family films for I, I don't know you know whether he was making them for moral reasons or whether it was just a marketing strategy that okay. there were there were all these theaters in the midwest uh I didn't want to see women in the stockings, you know, to see yeah. their ankles, right, yeah. and that kind of stuff. He was Tyler Perry before Tyler Perry. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, so CIA starts to smear. So they, well, after he died, they, they, there was a guy who worked for the CIA who had been the Havana bureau chief for the New York Times, and his job for the next 30 years was uh, was smearing my family. And he's working for the Times. He, he was, well, no, he had been. He had been, his cover had been New York Times bureau chief in Havana before he just came out of the closet and said, oh, Fuck I actually him, work yeah. for the CIA. Wow. Uh, oh, and then he transferred to Langley, and that was his job, and there was a whole cottage industry of Kennedy books that came out. And he's the one that started this rumor that my, you know, my uncle, or that they had, uh, my family, my grandfather had gotten Sam Giancana to fix the election in Chicago. In Chicago. I've seen an entire right. one hour documentary. So that is all baloney. And, well, like the and History that, Channel. In, and if you think about it, when I was, and then, and, and then, Giancana was angry because my father tried to put him in jail. Yeah, my That's, father had six FBI agents follow him. And when he got, when he left the, the, his home in the morning, they'd sit behind him in the movie theaters. Hmm. They they get the table next to him when he went out. They ruined his life. And um, so, but the thing is, when I was a kid, uh, like um, uh, maybe six or five or six year old kids. 
There's pictures of me sitting on my mother's lap in the front row of the Rackets Committee hearing, which my father was running. My uncle was senator. He was the head of that committee. My father was his counsel. And my father, I'm grilling Sam Giancana. I was there. Giancana took the Fifth Amendment over 100 times. My father was ridiculing him and saying, you know, he said, do you hang people? Is it true that you hang your enemies on meat hooks? And Giancana laughed. And, he, and my father said to him, you're giggling like a little girl. So they hated Despise each other. One so now, uh, uh, you know, what this room, this is, this is one year before the election. He's doing that to Giancana. Well, the idea that Giancana, then, then my father would then go bribe Giancana to fix the- One year before chicken. JFK won the election? Yeah. Okay. No, and my father ran the campaign yeah, for yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea that my father would go from that hearing room where you know the mob hated him, that somehow he would convince the mob to To now, fix the election. And, to fix the yeah. election. Now, was the election in Chicago fixed? Probably. How, how? Well, because Daly fixed all the elections, and they, Daly, you said Mayor Daly, he, he, he fixed the Democratic elections in Chicago, and the Republicans fixed them in Southern Illinois. So they were all fixed, <laughs> and in fact, they would wait for each other. What does that know? mean, fix? Explain, like how how, how do you uh, do have dead time? people voting? Have you know all of the different ways to get rid of ballot? I, I, you know, a million different ways. I mean, they found ballots in the Chicago River. Hmm. So, um, but they were mainly interested in the down ballot um, contest. And so, down judge, ballot means something. judges, you know, uh, you know the pre the, the people who were governing Chicago. That's what he was mainly interested in. But here's the thing: when the the election was over, some of the Republicans said, "Oh, they fixed it." So Daly said, let's do a recount of the entire state and I will personally pay for the recount. And the Republican election, election commission, which was run by Republicans, voted unanimously to not do that. Why? Because they, probably because they knew that an <laughs> account would- We both get exposed. Disclose yeah. everybody, yeah. And, but here, the, the bottom line punchline is that even if my, Uncle had lost Illinois. He would have still won still the election. Won the election. Uh, oh. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So that's another CIA <laughs> smear. Why is the CIA? Uh, why do they hate you guys so much? All right, guys. Let's take a break for a second. I need to point something out. How the UFC has uh, made me a better predictor Ooh. of basketball Ooh. outcomes. Talk to me. Okay. I wish that there was a way that like the line adjusted super quickly, but this was. Uh, a few nights ago, the Knicks were playing. Jalen Brunson suffers like what they believe is a non-contact knee injury. Scary. Right? Very scary. That's all, like almost always you're like, okay, that's ACL or something yeah. like that. Um, and he tries to lift up his leg and his leg is kind of like labored in his ability to lift it up and his foot is almost like dead. He has like a dropped foot, so he uh. can't move his foot. Everybody in the group chat immediately is like, oh, my God, Jalen tore, tore the ACL. It's over. Like, his knee injury. Yeah, this yeah. looks bad. You're whatever. a Knicks fan. You're prepared for the worst. Exactly. I go, yo, I think that he banged his perennial nerve, which is what we saw happen to Izzy, happen to this fighter, Crute. Isn't that what happened to Sugar Sean in that one fight? And then Sugar Sean. Or Sugar Sugar might have actually broken his foot. I'm not exactly sure. But, like, but there is this injury that happens when you bang the side of your knee. Your perennial nerve swells, and then you lose the ability to kind of, like, move your ankle. Yeah. Imagine I could have... Imagine in that moment, the line for the Knicks adjusted like crazy because yeah. they're like, without their superstar, they don't have a chance. Yeah. But I know. You know. I should have fucking taken advantage of it. Anyway, uh, I did not take advantage of it. But right now, we get to take advantage of Akash Singh's picks, uh, the well, Akash Singh locks. Hey, that's the beauty of prize picks. You don't need to have years of foresight, right. months of foresight. Right. You You're just right. pick once, You're you leave right. it alone. You're so right. here's your picks for what tonight. What do we got? What do we Singh got? locks for tonight. Alex Caruso, more than eight points against the Kings. I believe that they're not the strongest defensive team. Marvin Bagley Jr., 
Uh, I got him getting less than 21 and a half points plus rebounds. And I got DeMar DeRozan making less than half a three. I love DeMar DeRozan. I just don't know. You don't think he's going to hit a three? I just don't. I just don't want to be a three point shooter. I, I'm trying to hit one three. I was the least positive about this one, but it, I, the, the multiplier goes up with price picks. The more you pick. I would so, go more on that one. Well, you go more. I go less. All Let's right, see what happens. We'll see what happens. A hundred percent. Prizepicks.com. Anyway. Tell them about the promo code. Yeah. Promo code Schultz, S-C-H-U-L-Z. They're going to match your initial deposit bonus of a hundred dollars. So if you put up to a hundred, they put in a hundred, you go get that bread. Let's get back to the show. Why is the CIA, uh, why do they hate you guys so much? What is it about I mean, the Kennedys? You know, but there was a, a fit, and I wrote a book about this, this 60 year fist fight between my, my family and the CIA. It started, I think, in 1955. My uncle was uh, appointed to a commission uh, by, um, run by what's the, it's called the Hoover Commission, that looked at what the CIA was doing. And the CIA originally was created as an espionage agency. It wasn't supposed to do dirty tricks. Espionage means spying. Mm -hmm. It means data collection and analytics. Mm -hmm. And that's why it was started. Abroad, right? Not, 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 not it, Its charter forbids it from operating in the United States, from propagandizing Americans, from doing anything in oh, this really? country. Yes. <laughs> Which it violates constantly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but its charter prohibits that. So it wasn't supposed to do dirty tricks. And it's Midge, Alan Dulles, who was the Dulles. essentially the first director, manipulated. Um, and he had been at the OSS, which is the... Was Precursor the, to... Yeah, but the, uh, after the war, Congress and the Senate, Republicans and Democrats, said we can't, we can't have a secret uh, spy agency in this country. Okay. Because that's what... You know, totalitarian regimes do. That's the Stasi in East Germany. It's yeah. the KGB. It's PEEP in Chile. It's Savak in Iran. And, you know, the only totalitarian regimes have spy agencies. <laughs> so, uh, so, and everybody agreed on that. And then I, Truman I got in there and realized, okay, now we have one big bomb, right, that we can drop on the rest of the world. But you can't do that in all of these little contact, you know, these little brush fire rebellions that are happening. We have to have a way to fight these wars without dropping the bomb on everybody. Yeah. And so they, you know, realize the cheapest way to do that is let the CIA go. Handle all this. You know, to fix the elections, to assassinate leaders. They weren't supposed to assassinate anybody, but they, they started almost immediately. <laughs> Who was number one that they took out? Well, they, they deposed Mohammed Mossadegh in uh, 1953. So they, the agency was started in 47. And they began immediately overthrowing governments. The, the two most famous one are Mohammed Mossadegh in 53 in Iran. He was the first um, democratically elected leader of Iran in its 8,000 year history. Whoa. And then the next year they overthrew, and they did that because he loved the United States, Mossadegh, and in fact he threw the British out because he thought Churchill was trying to overthrow him. And, and his his aides were saying the U.S. is going to do it too, and he said, "No, the U.S. is a uh, was a colonial nation itself, and it threw it off, and they're idealistic, they're on our side." And he made a big mistake. Dulles sent Kermit Roosevelt over there and they overthrew him. And then the next year they, um, because Dulles, before he was at the CIA, had been a lawyer at Sullivan Cromwell. Okay. And Texco was one of his clients. His biggest client was United Fruit. And the next year, Jacobo Arbenz um, uh, nationalized United Fruit in Guatemala. And so they went down and overthrew him the Holy next year. And then, then they overthrew multiple governments in the next two years in Syria and Iraq and, you know, all over the Mideast in order to control the oil supply. Now, the incentive hmm. structure for overthrowing these governments, is it always monetary in terms of businesses that have been, you know, purchased out there or there's investing interest in the business out there like it was in Guatemala? Or is part of destabilization just like global colonial power and this is how we need to keep things yeah, up? Yeah, I mean— I it, what David Talbot, who wrote the best book about Dulles, it's called Devil's Chessboard. It's a really riveting book. If you start reading that book, you will not put it down. Okay. It's really, it's so crazy. 
But what he says in that book is that Dulles was incapable of distinguishing between American interests and the interests of the corporations who he had represented at Sullivan Cromwell. He honestly believed that though whatever was good for U.S. corporations good was good. Yeah. Hmm. And, you know, the CIA still has... I mean, that's what it does. It does regime change. It mainly funnels the money through USAID, which is a CIA puppet. I mean, they, they overthrew the government of Ukraine in 2014, which is really what this war is about. They spent $5 billion overthrowing that government and, and putting in, handpicking a U.S. government, which Victoria Nuland, who's the deputy secretary of state, they, they have her now. You can go on and listen to this on the internet. Her giving orders of uh, a voice mail of her, a voice recording of her giving orders to the U.S. ambassador of Ukraine a month before the coup in which she's picking the uh, the cabinet, the new cabinet. So this, you know, uh, obviously upset the Russians because... They don't want now, U.S. weapon systems in Ukraine. Okay, hmm. that makes sense. Now, did the Russians support the democratically elected government that the Americans overthrew? In Mossadegh? Mossadegh? No, no, in, uh, in Ukraine. Ukraine. Oh, in Ukraine? Before yeah. 2013. Yeah, I mean, that, that... Like, is it possible that they also... No, no, no. Their they information like, systems to prop up... Well, yeah, that was democratically elected. But, I mean... Is it? Is that in quotes democratically elected? Is it possible? No, no, they, the election as well? no, the thing is that a large percentage of Ukrainians are Russian, are ethnic Russians. So right. in Dabas, Lugansk, Crimea. Especially over there, yeah. 90% of the people there. And when, you know, um, uh, when, when, after we overthrew their government and then you know, started killing ethnic Russians, killed 14, the new government killed 14,000, illegalized language, killed 14,000 uh, Russians. And, you know, that's when Putin invaded Ukraine because, I mean, invaded Crimea because Crimea, um, uh, Vladivostok, is the biggest Russian port. It's the only warm water port. Yeah. And he saw, okay, they were going to invite the U.S. Navy in there and take away our port that's been ours for 347 years. And um, and that was, you know, untenable for their national security. I'm not defending Putin. I don't think he's a good guy, but I think it's important for Americans to understand our role and the provocations that led up to the war. Hmm. What did you think of Putin? By the way, my son fought in that war. Oh, really? Yeah. What did you think of Putin's interview with with Tucker? I thought it was fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Elaborate I, on that. What? What? Like. Well, I think. I mean, he didn't say anything that surprised me, but he, uh, you know, he just he talked about. Um, I mean, one thing, he confirmed something that we already know. Which? Which is, on two occasions, they had made these uh, very generous peace offers. The Minsk agreements? The first one was the Minsk Accords, and then again in April of 2022. And what he said is, we signed that agreement, and we, you know, the, the, the major, uh, the major, um, Objective for Russia was at that time was making us not move NATO into Ukraine. They don't want NATO there, and that's really what this war is about. And he said, um, he said, I, you know, we signed the agreement, and the, the principal part of the agreement was that NATO would not go into Ukraine, and I was withdrawing from Kiev, which we knew. But he said, as soon as I started withdrawing groups, troops from Kiev, um, they double-crossed us. And, you know, Biden sent Boris Johnson over there to, to force Zelensky to tear up the peace agreement. And since then, 450,000 Ukrainian kids have died in a war that should have never happened. Now, who's profiting from this war? If, if all of our... Well, if you look at why, why did we want to extend NATO? So, you know, in 1992... Um, when the wall came down in Berlin um, and the Soviet Union collapsed, 
Gorbachev went to John Major in England and uh, and Bush in the United States and said, "Look, I'm going to let you do something that no, that I'm never going to be able to go back to Russia because the Russian people are going to hate me so much. I'm going to allow you to reunify Germany, East and West Germany, under a NATO army. I'm going to move out 450,000 Russian troops." And I'm going to hand it over to you, but I want one promise from you. You will not move NATO to the east after that. You, you'll be satisfied with that. So five years later, and, they, and James Baker famously, who was the Secretary of State under Bush, famously said, promise Gorbachev, we will not move NATO one inch to the east. But what happened five years later, the neocons came into power in the U.S. government led by Zbigniew Brzezinski, and they published a plan saying, we're going to surround Russia with NATO. George Cannon, who is the most important diplomat arguably in American history, he was the architect of the containment policy during the Cold War, said, if you do that, you're going to force a violent response to Russia. Why are you treating Russia as an enemy? You should do a Marshall Plan with Russia and bring yeah. them into the community of nations. Why do you need a, a permanent enemy there? Can you, I, I yeah, just yeah, give you, yeah, I, yeah. I'll give you, I'm taking a shortcut and tell you. No, no, take as long as you want here. One of the, when, when, when we move, when we bring a new nation into NATO, mm -hmm. then the first part of that contract is that that new nation has to conform its um, its weapons purchases to NATO specifications, which means they have to buy their weapons from Northrop Grumman, <laughs> Raytheon, General Dynamics, yeah. Raytheon, Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin and Boeing. <laughs> That's close. And all of those companies are owned by BlackRock. And BlackRock <laughs> is, you know, the big So donor. they're incentivized to expand NATO because the only way that they can increase their profits is if they get more countries that have yeah. signed up. Well, it's a whole market that they now have a trap market. They can only buy from them. It's like Starbucks selling frappuccinos. It's like you want Starbucks <laughs> everywhere. Mm -hmm. And the, oh my God. Every okay. coffee shop should be a Starbucks. Yes. Yeah. And if so we one break one into a new market, there's also, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a confluence of ideological and economic incentives that you know, and and this seems like what is you know often happening in the United States, where the the corporate interests match up with the geopolitical interests, which are America wants to exert force against our enemies, and the corporations want to you know get as much profit as possible. So they probably align themselves in that way. And exactly. Could you argue that that is yeah. that does end up benefiting the American economy? And I'm not necessarily like a trickle down guy. I'm saying I'm not. Not a trickle down guy, but people who would believe that putting billions of dollars into corporations in America does end up benefiting the U.S. citizens, according to that line of thinking. Yeah, it, it creates a lot of jobs in our country in one industry, the defense industry. Um, and, you know, that's now our biggest export around the world. Um, does it benefit us over the long run? I would say no. That you know, we need to have, we need to rebuild our industrial base, and it allows the financialization of the American economy, because the the, the economy is now no longer based upon industrial production or any kind of production. It's, it's based upon speculation. Yeah. So everybody is. If you look at what's happening on Wall Street, they're no longer going factory by factory and saying what's the production, what's the efficiency, <laughs> yeah. what's the lowest cost, what's yeah. the future. They're all focusing on what is the Fed going to do this week, Yeah, right? And that's what everybody bets on. And it's financialized their economy. It's sent all of their industry. It's destroyed abroad. Yeah. It's destroyed the American middle class. And we do that by printing dollars. You print uh, $34 trillion of dollars that you don't have. Why would the world even value them anymore? And the reason that they continue to value them is because our military, we have 800 bases abroad yeah. and yeah. that kind of anchors this whole system. The system is gonna collapse, it's not sustainable. It is corrupt and uh, it's not, it, and it's already destroyed our moral authority around the world. And it now our influence around the world is this big compared to when I was a kid. And we had moral suasion, and we also had, you know, people wanted American leadership. Now they they consider it bullying, and um, and it's not sustainable. You, the, the national debt is now just the service on the debt is now larger than our military budget. 
But oh, uh, you know, digest that. Yeah, and if the interest rates, if yeah. interest rates raise, service meaning the interest on the yeah, yeah. the interest the on the VIG. debt. So yeah, the VIG. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So what you're so paying, what we're term. paying, is bigger than one point three trillion dollars. And if interest rates go up, like if interest rates got double from, let's say they go from two percent to four percent, that. Interest rate that service doubles. Yeah, yeah. So it goes from 1.3 trillion 1. to 2.6 6 trillion, and all you need, you, if you get up to the typical interest rates, which are eight or ten percent, it's the entire Cut every it. tax dollar collected in our country is going to service the debt. That's happening right now, and it's not, you know, it's not sustainable. And all of that is attached to, to the this, you know, the warfare state. Do you think there's a path? to redemption and getting the sway that you had, that the U.S. had when you were a kid? And if so, what is it? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I don't want to be, you know, plugging myself here. That Plug might, yourself. That's that's why you're here. Yeah, I think if I'm elected, we're going to how do you get that back. How do you reverse yeah. it? Yes, how? Uh, I think awesome. first of all, the world wants to see that, um, you know, America, and um, the America that they used to see, which is an America that is a moral authority, America that's telling the truth to people. Mm-hmm on every issue, an America that comes with a little bit of humility, um, that is not, you know, where, I, I mean, I'm gonna, I, I'm going to stop the CIA from these regime change operations and say, you know, it's a, we, we actually do support democracy. We're not, if somebody elects a leader, they ought to be able to serve and, and uh, you know, it's not the U.S. choice to do that. And uh, you know, I'll end that. But I, I, across the board, I'm the corporate corruption. This corrupt merger of state and corporate power happens within the agencies. The agencies are now all have become sock puppets for the industries they're supposed to regulate. And this and, is we have know, Vivek on, and he spoke about this. He used the term managerial class. Yeah, and I like the term because deep state is this like nefarious entity, but it's so conspiratorial that like I feel like people don't take it as serious as I they write should. It off, yeah, you kind of like write off the word deep state. Like, what is a deep state? I don't know who it is. Yeah, there. Like, I don't use that term for that reason. What would what is the term that you would use for it? Because I do think that you're tapping into. A, a feeling and sensation a lot of Americans have where they're disillusioned with government and the people in control and they feel like their desires are not being met by candidates is probably why you've had so much success because you're speaking to a lot of the frustrations that Americans have. Yeah. So what is that term they would use for the powers that be that are not il- elected but able to exert immense force and control, i.e. the people yeah, at the I CIA? Mean, I think Vivek's term is pretty good as a, as a managerial class. I mean, there are entities within the government that, uh, you know, are actually um, dictating a lot of this stuff. Like whom? Um, I would say probably most, you know, particularly with our foreign policy, the Atlantic Council. And the Atlantic Council has, uh, I mean, just go look at who's on it. There's six uh, former CIA chiefs on its uh, on the Atlantic Council. But these are elected officials or? No. And who appoints them? Um, they are in, they, they are appointed by invitation. Who is inviting? The the Atlantic Council. Um, what I'm trying to understand is like how do these positions of power? Uh, where do they come from? Like who creates well, them? They, how does the Atlantic Council even get power? Yeah. What? How does the Atlantic Council even get power? Can you just break this down for us, simplest possible terms? Like how does this get started? Who starts it? I mean, you know, there, I, I, there are a lot of different centers of power, and I'm just saying this is one of them because it really, um, everybody, the, it dictates U.S. foreign policy, and it dictates policy in NATO. It's, it, you know, these people are all highly respected. They tell the president, oh, yeah, uh, Vladimir Putin is a crazy person. He's about to invade all of Europe. We need to be over there, and they, uh, and, you know, we need to go to war with him. Mm-hmm. And they not only influence the U.S. government, but they uh, they are the primary body that influences NATO. There's other things, the Council on Foreign Relations, um, and then there are panels, you know, across the government that are made up of, um, 
uh, of industry people, people within who are, you know, who have, uh, and you can look at them in every agency, you know, in, in FDA, it's called VRPAC, and CDC is called ASAP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. And if you look at the people who sit on it, they're all people who are profiting from, you know, this, uh, mm-hmm. not from making people healthier, but from yeah. making, you know, from a sick country, <laughs> and a country that's constantly at war, and a country that is doing hmm. the opposite of what its ideals say it's supposed to be doing. How would you stop corporate influence in government institutions? Well, the 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 worst thing that happened in terms of corporate influence was the uh, Citizens United case, and it's hard to fix that. And just so that you know what Citizens United is, it was we lost democracy at one point in our history in the 1880s and 1890s. You had our country was being run by a corporate plutocracy, and it was John D. Rockefeller, the Mellons, the Carnegies, the Fricks, the Whitneys, and they all sat on interlocking boards for the Sugar Trust, the Rail Trust, the Steel Trust, the Oil Trust, etc. And at that time, there was no direct election of senators. So the senators were not chosen by the public. They were chosen by the legislatures. The legislatures were completely owned, the state legislatures, Hmm. by Congress. I mean, by these guys. In fact, it was said Hmm. that the only legislatures that you could not purchase, that could not be purchased, was the Pennsylvania state legislature because John D. Rockefeller owned them all and he wasn't selling any. Wow, and, and that, and so they would then pick the senators, and the everybody from top to bottom was chosen by this group. Didn't Rockefeller like bail out the entire country with like a check? Didn't you tell me the story? One of these guys, like the U.S. needed money, and he was like, "Yeah, I'll just write you a check." The different time, but uh, maybe during. Uh, I think a bunch of them actually came together. This was before. This was during the, right before the Great Depression. They just dumped a bunch of money in the stock market to try to regulate it, but different oh, than yeah. what we're talking okay. about. But go on, go on. Um, so, uh, so then you had a confluence of these extraordinary events that happened. You had the rise in the countryside of the populist movement, which can, was democratic. Can I, can I just say uh, one thing real quick? So when you have these people, the billionaires, the aristocracy, owning the legislative branch, they're dictating the laws in the country, essentially. Yeah, they were dictating the laws and they were also dictating the personnel. But I, I'll just do this very briefly. <laughs> I mean, so you had two big movements that happened. One was Republican, one was Democrat. Populists in the countryside, the organizing farmers, which were then a huge part of the population, the progressives in the city. And you had all, suddenly appear all these muckraking journalists who really changed America. Ida Tarbell, uh, Upton Sinclair, Sinclair Lewis, and many others. They were writing for a magazine called McClure's, and they started doing exposés on John D. Rockefeller and all the other robber parents. And America, everybody was reading those magazines. Everybody, the whole middle class was reading it, and there's a sense of indignation. And then you had one guy came along, Teddy Roosevelt, who was a member of the Arab plutocracy, and he wasn't intimidated by him, and he got elected president and started to dismantle him, and they passed the Sherman Antitrust Act, and he broke up uh, the Standard Oil, the biggest company in the world. Yeah, yeah. They passed the 40-hour work week. They let unions start to organize. They passed the... They gave women the vote. They, uh, they, uh, they passed... Frustrating. Uh, corporate income tax for the first time. They passed graduated income tax for the first time. The most important bill they passed was in, in 1908. They passed a, a law that made it illegal for corporations to give to federal or to federal political candidates. Yeah, yeah. So that stood for 102 years. And then Citizens United. And then Citizens United, this very business-friendly Supreme Court, Wait, real- in 2010 came and said a cor- that... That donations are free speech. Yeah. They're, pat- they're protected by the First Amendment, and you can't do anything to interfere with them, and that's the court we got today. Yeah. So it's really hard to fix that part of it, you know, which are, is the systemic part, because it unleashed the tsunami. So 
Just, I'm just, running against Biden and Trump, and both of them are going to have $2 billion. So just to clarify why this is difficult, you have a situation <laughs> before where these billionaires or corporations, if you will, the owners of these corporations are dictating the, the laws because they own the legislative branch of government. They own Congress, right? Uh, Teddy dismantles it. 102 years later, Citizens United essentially allows corporations to fund candidates. And yeah. now it's almost impossible to beat a corporately funded candidate. Yeah. So, so you're basic, you're back in the same system that Teddy had to break. Real quick question about Teddy. Is that why Teddy kind of has a shaky reputation historically? Like if they tried to smear him a little bit, like he's some weirdo that likes to go out to, where was it, <laughs> hang out in the forest for months at a time. I think he's actually, you know, according to public polls, one of the most uh, popular presidents in history. I mean, there's, progressives don't like him. Of course. Because he was a warmonger and he was an American imperialist. Yeah. And he, you know, he bullied his way around, you know, the, the, the Philippines, the, you know, built the, the uh, Panama Canal and, yeah. you know, and then, sent, and then took over Cuba. But right. he, he was the one, you know, they sent people down to help with the Cuban uh, insurrection against Spain. But in the end, he told the Cubans, oh, and by the way, we're keeping Guantanamo Bay, which is your biggest port. <laughs> so that's how we got Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> Shout out and, to Teddy. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, he did the same thing. He took over the Philippines and... Uh, and Guam, and and so people think of him as uh, as a, a, a imperialist, but I think genuinely his reputation has Mike. withstood the test of time. All right, guys, let's take a break for a second. Listen, you guys have uh, some bad habits. Maybe one bad habit in particular you need to quit, and uh, you know you're going to give yourself lung cancer or emphysema with that bad habit. I want you to stop. I want you to stop that bad habit. How do you beat a bad habit? you maybe replace it with a good one. Fume is that good habit, okay? So it doesn't feel like you're just quitting cold turkey and brutally shaking through your day. You have that same physical sensation going on with none of those negative side effects. I'm telling you, Fume is an innovative, award-winning, flavored air device that does just that. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. Instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavors. You got all these different flavors. I'm telling you, you take the hit, pull, it calms that desire, that sensation that you are addicted to. You have a very bad habit, and this is going to help you with that, okay? I'm telling you, the taste is fantastic. I prefer the mint. That's the one I go. They have plenty of different flavors. You guys choose whatever you want. Um, the feel, this is a nice feel to it. It also, you know, satisfies that little fidgety. The click, I love the click. Yeah, the click is nice. Yeah. The click is nice. Gives you something to do uh, for those ADD brains, okay? Fume just released the uh, magnetic stand for your fume as well, so there's no more losing it around the house. It's built with fidgeting in mind. Remember, so you can spin it all you want. So start the year off right. The good habit, okay, is going to be Fume. So tryfume.com slash flagrant. The website is tryfume.com slash flagrant. That is F-U-M for fume. And getting the journey pack right now when you go to tryfume.com slash flagrant, fume is going to give the listeners of this show 10% off when they use the code flagrant. Okay? So use fume. Start that good habit. Let's get back to the show. All right, guys, we're going to take a break real quick because your bank sucks. Probably. How do I know? Because most banks sucks. That's why you need Current. Current actually helps you build your credit, get your pay paychecks faster, and gives you a great interest rate on your savings. We're going to start with this. You see what this is? This is the build card from Current, and here's why it's great. It's a secured credit card that lets you use your own money to build up your credit. What that means is it functions kind of like a debit card. You buy shit using your money, not the credit companies. But while a normal debit card doesn't have any effects on your credit score, the build card reports all of your purchases to credit companies, so it helps you build your credit score. The build card reports all your purchases, like I said, and there's no credit check or history required to get this card, so if you are looking to improve your credit score, this is the card for you. I know people who use it and love it, and you will too. On top of all that, when you switch to Current and set up a direct deposit, you can get up to 
paid up to two days faster. Guys, it's your money you worked hard for. Now get it faster. And maybe most importantly, you can get up to 4% interest on your savings with Current. Guys, how much more of a no-brainer can we make it? So, guys, what are you waiting for? Get Current, the future of banking. Go to current.com slash flagrant or download the app that is current.com, C-U-R-R-E-N-T dot com slash flagrant. Terms apply. Current is a financial technology company, not a bank. Services provided by Choice Financial Group. Member FDIC, member FDIC. For full terms and conditions, visit current.com or call 888 Oh, are you guys the class clowns in here? <laughs> um... No. <laughs> more, more school shooter vibe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Get the job done. I was a class virgin. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Uh, and, and we're back. We're back. We took a little pee break. Uh, I think we're all kind of still digesting this. This is kind of crazy. Um, okay. So would you immediately tear apart Citizens United? Well, I, that's the problem, is you can't do that as president. I mean, that's now the Constitution. Right. The only thing that's going to fix that is if all of these Supreme Court justices, well, you know, after they get old and retire or die, and new ones come on and say, yeah, this is not a good system. Yeah. And, you know, the, speed, the First Amendment does not uh, protect legalized bribery, which is what a campaign donation is. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say, for example... We strip it down, get rid of it, tear it up. And each citizen can only donate up to $10,000 to a candidate or whatever that number is. We can adjust that yeah. number. Uh, doesn't that incentivize the wealthy to run? Because now they can spend their own money, whereas some poor dude who wants to be president doesn't have it, and he has to hope he's getting all these donations. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So this system, system. this system's never going to be perfect, but I'd right. rather a guy run and say, hey, I'm financing myself. I own myself. Than being owned by the corporations. Yeah, and you don't even know who owns them. I mean, they. it's been suggested that they, they should, uh, you know, politicians should have to wear those those coveralls that they wear in the NASCAR races. Yeah, where you have the logos of the people. Yeah, the logos yeah. Of the love people. it. Yeah, that's <laughs> love great. It. Are you financing your own campaign? No. So who's in your you think Cheryl would still be mad. <laughs> 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 All right, so what? Oh, yeah, here you go. Okay. No, um, we, 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 you know, the, the campaign itself is financed by small donations. Uh, the maximum donation is $6,600. Mm -hmm. And uh, and those are hard to raise. Uh, I'm competing against the White House, the Democratic and, uh, and the R DNC and the RNC, and they can take essentially, I think, $250,000 is their minimum. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm at a big disadvantage in fundraising. Um, but uh, there's also a couple of super PACs, and the super PACs that support me, I'm not allowed to, you know, coordinate with them. Uh, but they've raised a lot of money. They, I think one of my super PACs has maybe raised 70 million bucks. Can you explain what a super PAC is? Yeah. What they did is they said, okay, federal, you can't donate directly to a federal political candidate. Uh, the maximum for that is 6,600. But you can donate to an entity which is called a PAC or a super PAC. And you can donate unlimited to them and they can help on the campaign but they're not allowed to talk to you about how they're going to help so you can't coordinate with what's them. the justification for that i guess it's uh it's supposed to be a place where it's i mean none of it makes sense but i i guess the best justification is that if you if you're very rich and you want a certain person to win you ought to be able to promote their candidacy without giving them money. And, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, so they can buy commercials for you or something? They just Yeah, can't. they buy. In fact, the Super Bowl commercial was purchased by my Super PAC. Oh, wow. So, I, didn't, you know, Cheryl and I were sitting watching the Super Bowl with oh, my you kids. Didn't even know you didn't know that commercial no. was going to happen? No. Wow. <laughs> How bizarre. And now, I is, heard her let out a yelp. <laughs> yeah. My son said something, and I That's looked up, crazy. you know, and because it, it was an ad, so I was I was looking at my phone, yeah, and then I heard both of them, uh, you know, sort of <laughs> make these surprise shouts, and then looked up and saw the ad. And now, do you have to? You have to live with whatever they say about you, I guess. Yeah. 
I mean, but usually the super PAC is going to say much nicer things about me than, you know, the Democrats and Republicans. Right. Okay, and uh, now that you've run the, for president. The, the, the DNC yeah. now has a van that follows me around that has billboards on this. I mean, you know, those moving billboards. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And so they. Who's more corrupt? The DNC or the RNC? Yeah. I, I'd probably be equally corrupt, but I don't know. I, I, I don't even know how the metric by which you would measure that. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, but they're all, I mean, the DNC is really misbehaving. They're really trying to block people. Yeah, they try to block you, right? They try to block me. They, they try to block Trump, and I'm not a fan of Trump's, but I want to be on a, on a, on an, a level you know, battlefield with him. I don't want to beat him because a court threw him out. I want to beat him because I'm able to make the argument to the American people that I should be president and I have a debate and that kind of stuff. I, I don't think it's good for our country. I don't think it's good for the DNC. I think this persecution that the DNC has leveled, that people see that as unfair. Americans just viscerally are saying, this guy is being attacked and they're, you know, it's moving huge numbers of voters over to him because yeah. they're pissed at what the DNC is doing. Yeah, It's also terrible for America, who are supposed to be the exemplary democracy in the around the world. This is what they do in, you know, in banana republics. Yeah, You don't want to run against the guy because he's popular. So you get a judge to throw them out. Yeah, that's a great comparison. And you know, it's not, it's not America. Yeah. And they're, you know, they're doing the same thing to me. They're trying to make sure that nobody can vote for me, rather than having President Biden come out and say, "Here's why I think I should be a good president." Yeah. And here's why I think you shouldn't be. And let's have that discussion. Yeah. Uh, not just say, you know, you're not going to let me on the ballot. You're not going to, you're going to disenfranchise Americans here's so they can't talk the to the you. Democrats know, you. kind of seem from a distance more crooked is the Republicans didn't seem to want Trump in 2016. They could not stop him in the primary. He just fucking destroyed everybody. It seemed like on the flip side with Hillary and with you in 2024, it's like, we don't want this guy, this person to win Bernie in 2016, you in 2024. We're just going to have super delegates, and then we're going to get our person in there, and that's what it's going to be. Eliminate yeah, the competition. I, I think that's right. And also the fact that he won't give me Secret Service protection, you know, that's another kind of weaponization of yeah, the federal agencies to, 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 good, to good. help, help him win. Who is uh, that guy? He got He's Ted from- Cruz's nephew back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. He's strapped, right? <laughs> He's strapped. Very right? much so. He didn't like that. He didn't like that. You look nothing like him. You look nothing like him at all. He's making sure you guys don't make a lunch at me. Fair enough. Fair enough. But, um, Pretty yeah, funny, yeah. They, you know, I, I have Gavin DeBecker, um, Associates, who's who's giving me protection, it's really you know good, but it's very expensive. So a third, one out of every three dollars I raise is, is, going, protection. is going to, to you know, to this, and it's not, it's not fair. I could be using that, you know, so I should be funny. able to use that to make the argument. Okay, um, your last name, Kennedy. One of like the American dynasties, I feel like most Americans, maybe most people around the world, very familiar with it. Uh, what are the benefits and what are also like, not what are the benefits, what are the rules of being a Kennedy? Are there rules? Is there like a culture that you all have to live by? That's a great question. Is there a way to behave? Like what, are, what is the- Yeah, I mean, I think we were all raised in a milieu where, um, you know, we have expectations of each other that you're going to, you know, try to do something good for other people. You know, and, you know, many of my cousins, there were 29 cousins, 29 grandchildren of Joe Rose Kennedy. And most of us were raised during the Camelot era. Mm. And, you know, I think that really sort of dictated a lot of our worldview and our lives. We all, all, I think, were raised with this attitude that our lives would be consumed by some great controversy and that it would be a big privilege for us um, to be able to play a a role, an efficacious role in that. Um, You know, I... um, 
of course, all, you know, everybody's lives diverge. And I've got members of my family now who do not like the fact that I'm running against President Biden. I have five members of my family who work for the administration or closely with the administration. And, you know, President Biden has a bust of my father behind him at the, in the Oval Office. He's been a long-term friend of my family's. So I have, there are people in my family who are not excited about that. But, you know, I think generally we all, you know, we were raised arguing with each other. My father would come home in the evenings from the Justice Department and he would set up debates at the dinner table and we would have to argue a point. My grandfather did that to his nine children. And that, you know, we argue with each other without hating the person, you know, which I think is a good thing for that the country to be able to do. One thing I really admire, I'm even listening to you talk, I don't agree with everything you say, but you surround yourself with people who don't agree with it. Cheryl will publicly say she disagrees yeah. with you about X, Y, and Z. You say on this pod, my kids think I'm a kook sometimes. <laughs> like, I really think that is a thing that is missing from the spirit of America right now, and I think it's very cool that you are so open to people disagreeing with you. I mean, I argued about my with my son on Ukraine. You know, from the beginning, and he just, he pushed back on me, and then, you know, he put his money where his mouth was and went over there and joined the Foreign Legion, and he fought the Kharkiv Offensive, and, you know, mm-hmm. I'm I'm lucky that he came back alive, but, mm-hmm. you know, he, I, I raised the kids, and my grandfather raised his kids, and in fact, my grandfather um, sent his kids over to London School of Economics, to study on a guy under a guy called Harold Lasky, who was regarded as the greatest socialist philosopher of the time, and my grandfather hated him hmm. and hated socialism, but he wanted his children to be exposed to different ways of thinking and to be able to do critical thinking themselves. And you know, they traveled around Europe. They went to. Spain during the Spanish Revolution. They went to Hitler's Germany. Mm. Um, and they, uh, you know, and he wanted them to be exposed to every kind of thought. And he believed, he loved our country because in our country, you're sp- everything's supposed to be done by debate. And the, the best ideas, the ones that become policy, are ideas that have triumphed in the marketplace of ideas. Mm. And, you know, in, in the annealed in the, in the furnace of debate. Mm. And that's really important for democracy because democracy is actually a very inefficient system. You know, it takes a lot of effort yeah. to get anything done. And so totalitarian systems have a big advantage on us. And the one advantage that we have is the, the, this open ferment of debate, which ultimately gives rise, you know, uh, gives precedence to the ideas that win that contest. And that's supposed, you know, the framers of the Constitution believe that that would put us at an advantage with totalitarian regimes. And it certainly puts us at a business advantage. Mm. There's, you know, there's no country like ours. Somebody said to me the other day, what do you see that's happening good in America today? And, I, you know, the, it's this entrepreneurial spirit that we have in this country that really does not exist anywhere else yeah. in the world, that people really believe that they can start a business and have an idea and may bring it to fruition. And uh, you don't get that in Europe. Yeah, not at the same level for sure. Yeah. 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 yeah, you can be the best version of yourself here. Yeah. I think a lot of people feel that way. Also, guys, we got to talk about this bad boy. You know what this is? This is an extra wallet, the world's largest smart wallet brand. This is the best wallet on the market. First of all, they got this thing right here. You see that? Quick card access. Every card you need right there at your fingertips. You can fit four or five in there. You also got this little clip for your money. You're good. This is all you need. Small trackable. That's very important. I literally lost my wallet all weekend one time because I'm a dumbass and I just put it somewhere. This wallet, you will not lose. It is trackable worldwide. It's also voice activated. You could literally call it using Google Home, Alexa, Siri, whatever. And these wallets, most importantly, probably offer RFID protection. You know, all the identity theft, the skimming that happens, you don't even just like that. They just skim. I don't know the mechanics of it. I think it's like that. Anyway, these offer RFID protection, guys, this is the best wallet on the market. It's such a fucking no-brainer to cop this. And if you check out all the wallets at shop.extra.com slash flagrant, that's shop 
dot e k s t e r dot com slash flagrant. You can get up to twenty five percent site wide with the code flagrant. Again, that is shop dot extra dot com slash flagrant. Let's get back to the show. All right, guys, let's take a break for a second. There are many things about life that is very hard. Paddle is very hard. Okay, bandejas are very hard. Vibras are very hard. Okay, ground strokes are very hard. Playing the net is very hard. The volley is very hard. But one thing that is not hard at all is submitting an injury claim with Morgan and Morgan. That is incredibly easy. It's twenty twenty four. Now, we got to talk about this. If you get injured by a person, place, or thing, you deserve to get paid, okay? And Morgan & Morgan has got your back. You can check out Morgan & Morgan. It is very easy. Like I said, incredibly easy. Amer America's number one the largest injury law firm. They have over 100 offices nationwide and more than 1,000 lawyers with over $20 billion recovered from over 500,000 clients, Morgan & Morgan has a proven track record of fighting to get you full and fair compensation. And like I said earlier, submitting an injury claim with Morgan & Morgan is unbelievably easy, okay? It's more like using an app than it is uh, uh, filing a legal document, okay? If you're ever injured, you can check out Morgan & Morgan. Their fee is free unless they win. That means they only get paid if you get paid. For more information, go to forthepeople.com slash flagrant or dial pound law, that's pound 529 from your cell phone. That's F-O-R, thepeople.com slash flagrant or pound law, pound 529 from your cell. Remember, this is a paid advertisement now let's get back to the show. I've yeah. heard people will kind of use your family legacy to kind of leverage a, a, a attack against you as a president, presidential candidate. I've heard people say, you know, he's a Kennedy. Kennedys, what do they know about the middle class? What do they know about working hard and you know being working class people? I'm curious, what would be your rebuttal to to that point? Well, you know, my I, I, think I would say. say <laughs> <laughs> but what does a Kennedy know about the working class? I thought that was yeah. 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 some people are saying. I mean, you I went mean, to yeah, some saying, people. You went to it's jail, good. then got into Harvard. Like it's pretty fucking. <laughs> You know what I mean? That is a nice move. <laughs> what? Jail then Harvard? It was, I'm fairly certain. That no, no, you went to, you got like kicked out of some boarding schools and then you went yeah, to Harvard. But I went to prison for, her. I spent the summer of 2001 in a maximum security prison in Puerto Rico. So yeah. I have been to jail. Oh, hell yeah. But, you know, my my father, you know, um, you, in his presidential campaign, he he did something that had that everybody thought was impossible, which was to unite uh, white working class Americans and middle class Americans with the with the poor, with uh, people of color, with American Indians, with Cesar Chavez, um, and with uh, and with urban blacks. And you know, when I was a kid. My father would take us whenever we traveled anywhere. He'd always take us to an Indian reservation nearby. Uh, when we went to Appalachia, he'd, he'd take us to a place where there was a lot of poverty. Uh, on weekends, he'd take us a drive, a drive through southeast Washington, and he would say to us, um, "These are these are our people. These are Kennedy people. These the um." The, the wealthy people in this country, they don't need a, a politician or a lawyer or anything else. They don't need the Kennedys. They already have the system rigged. And he said, these are your people. And, you know, my father would come back. He came back one time from Mississippi, and we were all sitting at dinner, and he came back and he said to us, today I saw a, a family, I visited a family who was, there were two families living in a house smaller than this dining room. And they were, and they have only, the children have only one meal a day. And he said, when you get older, I want you to help those people. And so that was kind of a message that, you know, that was part of, I think, all of our growing up. It was an expectation of benevolence. You're going to help service. somebody who's less fortunate. Like, you know, my aunt, a unit driver, founded Special Olympics. Her son, uh, Anthony Shriver, who's a very uh, strong supporter of my campaign, is running my campaign in Florida, was the founder of Best Buddies, which helps people with intellectual disabilities mm -hmm. to unite them with college kids. Another of his brothers runs UNICEF. Another of his brothers runs Save the Children. 
And, you know, you go through my family and most of them are doing things like that where they're, where they're you know, doing things to stand up for the most vulnerable, the alienated, dispossessed people in the society and, and bring them into the American experience. Hmm. That's awesome. Wow. And they keep trying to kill you guys. <laughs> What the fuck is this about? Well, that's that's a question I have. You yeah. firmly believe the CIA killed your uncle, killed your father, and well, you I was saying, I mean, you know, my father. The the, the abundance of evidence on my on my uncle's death, the CIA was involved. I think it's beyond any dispute. If I were a prosecutor, I feel I could win that case without doing any further discovery, just because my with my father. Uh, I always assumed that Sir Ann killed my father. Sir Ann confessed to the crime, confessed to killing him. There were 77 eyewitnesses in the room. And, um, you know, and so I didn't think there was any question. And then a guy called Paul Schrade, who is one of my father's close friends, he was a deputy director of the United Auto Workers. He had brought, recruited Cesar Chavez into the labor movement. He was standing next to my father the night that my father was killed. And he took the first bullet. So he got shot in the head by Sir Han. Sir Han was waiting at a steam table. And my father was brought through the kitchen where he was not scheduled to go. Mm. And Sir Han fired two shots at my father. The first one hit Paul Schrade in the head. The second one hit a door jam behind my father, the wooden frame of the door. The LAPD later took it out of that, you know, removed it. Then he was grabbed by six men, including uh, Rayford Johnson, who was the uh, 1960 decathlon champion, one of my father's best friends, Rosie Greer, who was part of the fearsome force, um, um, and, uh, and three other guys, or four other guys. They, they pinned him against the steering table, and they took his gun hand, and they put it, pushed it away from my father, pointing the opposite way. Mm -hmm. But Rayford Johnson later told me he was trying to pry the gun out of Sir Hans. And Sir Hans is a little guy when I met him in prison. He was, I, the first thing that impressed me is how tiny and frail he looked. But Rayford Johnson said that he had superhuman strength. And he then fired off six more shots and emptied the chamber. But exactly the opposite direction of my father. And all of those shots hit people. Mm. So we know what happened to every bullet in his gun. He was always in front of my father and uh, never got behind him. But the bullets that killed my father, according to Thomas Noguchi's autopsy report, Thomas Noguchi was the most important coroner in American history. And my father's autopsy is called the perfect autopsy. Because Noguchi knew that what had happened in Dallas with my uncle, where the autopsy was completely botched. Mm. And so he wanted to make sure nobody, you know, to avoid all that criticism. So he flew in the chief coroner of all the armed service, every branch of the armed service, and a lot of other famous coroners. And they all sat in the theater and watched him perform the autopsy. And what his autopsy found is my father was shot four times from behind, never from in front. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The shots, one of the shot passed harmlessly through his shoulder pad. The other three, two lodged in his back. The other one was right behind his ear. And that in each case, they were contact shots, meaning the barrel of the gun was touching his wow. skin yeah, or that's half an inch from it. And they left carbon tattoos. And they all had a, an upward angle so that whoever was doing it was standing behind my father and the, and holding the gun, not directly at him like that, but at an angle where you could keep him closer. So it was almost and, like... And the, the guy cover. who was in that position is a guy called Eugene Thane Cesar, and he was a security guard who was hired two days before. Oh. When my father's schedule was already known. So wow. now he's walking through this kitchen, which he shouldn't be walking through. He's got this well, my security he, guy. He grabbed the security guard is the guy who steered him into the ambush. That's so what I'm he saying. had my father's um, elbow and he was he was directing him. And then, you know, Sir Hen starts firing. My father then falls back and he lands on Cesar. Cesar and 
Wait, Eugene is, what's his last Eugene name? Eugene Thane Cesar. Fan Cesar. Thane, T oh, Thane Cesar. Yeah, yeah. And my father must have known he was being shot from behind because the last thing he did is rotate and turn and pull off the clip on tie that Cesar had on. Wow. Get the fuck out. Oh, you see the original early pictures before my mother took that out and put a rosary in his hand. But um, he originally, he has that tie in his hand, and there's pictures of Cesar from that night that don't have a tie on. Cesar, Cesar was, um, was seen by all the eyewitnesses with his gun drawn. When he pushed my father off, he had his gun drawn. He was asked by the police, why, why did you have your gun drawn? And he said, I was shooting at Sirhan, but there's no evidence of that. And then he was caught in multiple, multiple lies about what he did with the gun, that the police did not take the gun from him that night. Oh, so he was a, There was a gun that was fired at the scene and the police and, did and not. And the police did not take it. And, and they, you know, the police also destroyed all the photos before trial. They collected every photo taken in that room, 2,200 photos, and destroyed them all. Who, who hired Eugene? He, he was hired company. by a, a company called A Security, but he had a real job. His real job was at the Boeing plant, and he had a high security clearance. He was allowed in the top secret parts of the plant. Before that, he had worked for Hughes Engineering, which, you know, Howard Hughes was very much, you know, the people, a guy, Robert Mayhew, who is his deputy, was deeply involved in the Kennedy, the JFK assassination. Now, here's what happens next. <laughs> a guy shows up as Eugene, as Sirhan's lawyer. It's an attorney who is at that point uh, involved in the Friars Club case. Do you know what the Friars no. Club is? It's a, it's a well, club. I know the Friars Club in New York, but yeah, I don't know well, the case. Yeah, well, the original one is in L.A., and okay. it's, it was famous because the Rat Pack, Joey Bishop, Frank Sinatra, yeah, yeah. all of those guys, Sammy Davis, Dean Mark, Martin, were all members. And it was run by Mickey Cohen, who's the mafia yeah. chief, and Johnny Roselli, okay. who was... Roselli was the Cuba guy. Liaison. He was the liaison. yeah. And so, uh, and so, they, they, they we, need have a, the, we need the red string. They have a lawyer, and, yeah, and the wall the full of pictures. Their lawyer, or uh, Mickey Cohen's lawyer, is shows up. Uh, he Mickey he is, Cohen is Alcatraz, right? He's the guy. Mickey who Cohen is the Alcatraz, mafia boss. Mafia in boss LA. in L.A. Yeah, yeah, they've been in a bunch of movies. Yeah, yeah. Okay, wow, wow. And he uh, and the, the lawyer is now, has been indicted because in the Friar, the Friars Club, they, they, it turns out that the mafia had secret- uh, Recording? They, they, had, they had a television camera, they had cameras in the, on the roof of the Friars Club and they were looking at everybody's cards and fixing the games. <laughs> and then it's a famous trial that took you know, many weeks. Okay. LA. In that trial, it comes out that the defense my, the mob lawyers had obtained the grand jury testimony, which is completely illegal. You go to jail for a long time for that. Oh, this attorney was charged with that. He's, so he's under a lot of stress. He's, char he's trying the case for the mafia that he doesn't want to lose. And he's charged with stealing the grand jury testimony. And he somehow finds time to show up and represent Sir Ann. So he goes... Mm. So he's Sirhan's lawyer. So you think... And he tells Sirhan, you got to plead guilty. And then he buries all of the forensic evidence, all the ballistic evidence, wow. which if, if there's no way Sirhan could have been convicted because the gun, the bullets that were in my father did not match the bullets that were in other people. They didn't come from the same Also, gun. 13 shots fired. Sirhan's gun only holds eight. Exactly. So we know that there, it's not like he's reloading. And there's recording. There's audios of it, you know, of the 13 shots. Wow. So this well, is- Anyway, it's a lot of circumstantial evidence. It's not the kind not of evidence that we- I think that that's well, solid. It's, it's, no, it is but circumstantial. But you said with your uncle, you with think it's uncle, not circumstantial. With my uncle, it's just black and white. But with my father, it's circumstantial. So you cannot definitively say, but you can say there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of- Wait, why is it wacky. so black and, and white that's, with yeah, your Yeah, I hate to move Oh, you know what? I, death, I, I, 
it would take me three days to go through the evidence, you know, to even give you the tip of the iceberg. People who wanted, who are genuinely curious about my uncle's assassination, the CIA involvement, should read a book. There are many books, but I think the best one is a book called The Unspeakable by Jim Douglas. And what he's done is he's taken this mountain of evidence and he's distilled it all and it's riveting. It's very, very easy to read and it's it's really fascinating. And, uh, you know, I think it's impossible to read that book and come away without... Um, thinking that, you know, the CIA hmm. <coughs> killed JFK. Okay, uh, is it possible that any kind of mind-altering uh, experiments or substances were used in both cases? Like you've heard of MK Ultra. Oh yeah, well, MK, oh, oh, that's interesting that you say that because- Because didn't Sirhan say that he- He, didn't have he any believes that he was um, hypnotized. And and the and the defense, the, even the uh, San Quentin, Psychiatrists, uh, the defense, and prosecution scientists all said it was hypnotized. And I'm not arguing this because I really don't know. I'm just saying that there's a lot of fishy stuff about this. But there's a guy called Dan Martin who teaches at Harvard Medical School. Got him. <laughs> you, you got it. And, uh, <laughs> and he is the world's expert on hypnosis. And okay. he's been in. To hypnotize Sirhan many, many, many times. And he said, there, there, I've talked to him. He said, there's four classes of, of people in hypnosis. I, I, I don't know any of this, but I, I think it's number one is the people who simply cannot, cannot be, be hypnotized. Yeah. And then four is people who are the easiest hypnotized. And he told me this, he said Sirhan's like 4.9. <laughs> And he said that um, that when he goes into Sirhan, he takes out he takes out a, a coin and shows it to Sirhan, and Sirhan immediately goes out. And he he said his his head flips back, and snot starts pouring out of his nose, so it's involuntary, and his eyes roll up. And then he gives them a post-hypnotic suggestion, and they. Suggestion, for example, he'll say to him, when I, you know, after I wake you up, if I ever show you a handkerchief, I want you to climb on the roof of the cell. So then he'll wake him up and um, and he will, uh, he'll, he'll wait a while and he'll, he'll fool with the handkerchief. And Sir Anne will start climbing on the cell. But if you, he said, if you ask her, and why are you doing that? He said, I just need the exercise. He'll deny that he's been hypnotized. So I, again, I'm not, this gets really deep into sort of conspiracy, and I am not arguing that this You're happened. You're saying these things are also true. What? You're saying these things are also true. These, about these are true, and you can make of them what you will, but, um, and there's a lot of other, you know, really, I mean, I, 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 really interesting parts of the story that are, you know, that are fishy. And it's not circumstantial to you. It's black and white. I could prove this in a court of law if given the opportunity. Well, sir, and no. no sir, Jeff, is Jeff, totally, Jeff, sir, to me, it's all circumstantial. There is no, you know, no confessions, Sorry. none of that. But with, with, um, with my uncle, I don't, I, I think it's black and white. Mm-hmm. Are you scared and at all? That's my if question. If you do get into power, that, that this same and that know, was my circumstance th- will <laughs> happen to you? Well, I'm not saying- scared. But I'm also not stupid about it. I know that what I'm doing is, you know, challenging trillions of dollars of of financial interests and, and power interests. And, and the CIA a lot of specifically, people, which, you know. Yeah, the CIA, the, you know, other interests too. Oh, I know, you know, and so I'm not stupid. I take precautions. I do things that I don't want to do. Hmm. You know, I don't, you know, I... Uh, like, for example? Well, I don't like a guy following me when I go to the bathroom, right? Mm, right. And I, I want to get out and, you know, if there's people in a supermarket, you know, I, I have these arguments with my team all the time. I said, oh, I wanted to go out. You know, they had this big van. I gave a speech down in, in bed this week, two days ago, and there was a van outside that the DNC is paying. 
to that has you know uh, that has slanders about me, you know, running in <laughs> in lights. It's one of those moving billboards that is constantly changing. I want to go outside and talk to the driver and also get my picture taken in front of the van, right? <laughs> great and the, the, Did they say so, no to that? Yes, yeah, so my security team wouldn't let me do that. There are certain things they say you can't do that. Hmm. And I, I, I got to do what they tell me to do because otherwise they'll pull it. Do you have to, do they charge you extra because you're like a high risk like this? No, I, you know, Gavin DeBecker would give it to me for free. Right, because he loves me, and yeah. he. Um, but I'm saying the security he, guys. He's very here. supportive, and he runs the company. But he can't, because I can't take anything for free. So I have to pay the full fare. So that's what I'm doing. Wow. So nobody can give it to me for free. What What happened to this guy Eugene, the the security oh, guard? Yeah. It's interesting. He went to, and the whole story is fascinating because actually Sirhan worked at a track that apparently was, it was, I think it was in the name of Dina De Laurentiis, but the true owner was Mickey Cohen, and he worked at a horse track. Mm -hmm. And at that horse track, they were, um, the, the stable boys and the walker, he was a walker, he'd never been on a horse before. And the trainers were all experimenting with hypnosis on their lunch breaks, their, their different breaks. So they were all, you know, hypnotizing each other. And, you know, who knows what happened. Maybe it was a screening, you know, issue there. But I'll just tell you one other interesting fact. You mentioned MK Ultra. Yeah. One of the, the hospitals that apparently was used MK Ultra was, a, I think it was a naval base. There was a naval infirmary in Pasadena. Sir, and one day they said to Sir, and we want you to get on the horse. He'd never been on a th any horse, and they were going to put him on a thoroughbred and have him racing around a quarter mile track. Obviously, he falls off. He hits his head on the rail. He's brought to the Pasadena Hospital. Get the fuck out of here. And he, his memory is that he stayed in that hospital for three months. But when his appeals attorney Great. went to the hospital and got his records, it said he got four stitches and was discharged in an hour. Wow. And he has very vivid memories of what took place in this hospital. He said there were other people from the track who were also there that had bandages on their heads. Oh, again, this is stuff he says. That, right. And, you know, I'm not assigning any credibility to it. I'm just, it's part of this, you know, this, uh, it's part of this, you know, a lot of the uh, questions that I would like to ask people that were never asked of people. There's a lot of women that complain about gaslighting from their boyfriends. <laughs> yeah. Nobody has been gaslit more than the Kennedy family. <laughs> I mean, how do you stay sane? Like, there is one narrative that is constantly being pushed out in media, in film, in television, and then there is another completely plausible, plausible narrative that you and your family are investigating. Uh, My family's not investigating. My family, family does not want anything to do with it. They this. just accept it? You know, it was so shattering to my siblings and to my, you know, and if you, you were not around when, when we were kids, but um, for, for maybe 20 years, the Zabruder films were played almost a, as a loop. On so television. you have to watch this. And, my, and when those years. came on in my household, the TVs were turned off. People, were, everybody was so devastated by this and they don't want to, you know, nobody's bringing, nothing you do is going to bring my father back. Nothing is going to bring my uncle back. My father, when he, the first day when my uncle was killed, uh, I came home from school. My mother picked us up early and my father was walking in the yard with John McComb, who was the head of the CIA. And he was the first person to get over there because the CIA is only a half a mile from my house. And McComb used to come there every afternoon and swim in the pool. But that, as soon as the first thing they, they did, my, my dad did when he learned that his brother, when J. Edgar Hoover told him his brother was shot he, on the telephone as he called up the CIA and said, the desk, sorry, the desk officer and said, did your people do this? Wow. He asked the same question to John McComb. 
John McComb, you know, had been brought, my uncle had fired Alan Dulles and Richard Bissell and Charles Cabell, the guys who had orchestrated the Bay of Pigs because they lied to him. And yeah. he said, I want to take the CIA and shatter it into a thousand yeah, pieces yeah, and yeah. scatter it to the winds. He fired them and they brought in, my, my uncle originally wanted my father to run the CIA because he thought it's so <laughs> it's such a mess and only Bobby can fix it. My grandfather had stepped in and said, you can't do that. You can't have your brother running the spy agency. It's like Stalin and Molotov. It's, you can't have the brother of it's a president close. of the United American States running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just terrible optics for yeah. the whole world. Yeah, yeah. You don't Smart. want that. Smart. So they brought in John McCone, who was like a Republican business guy, very pious Catholic, and he ran it. But nobody ever told him anything. So, you know, the, the whole sort of bureaucracy that's under... <laughs> He doesn't know what's going on. And then my father then called a, one of the Cuban uh, Bay of Pig leaders, a guy called Harry Ruiz, who was very close to my family, and was in a hotel room in Washington, D.C. with a famous writer who wrote the book on the Bay of Pigs. And my father um, said to him, did your guys do this? So that was his first instinct. And then, you know, he then didn't talk about it until a week before his election. He refused to talk about it. But you would ask about, and my family is still that way. They're still in shock. There's still PTSD in my family from what I, you know, I mean, we're all there, watch my dad die, you know. A, a, a bunch of us kids were there and watching me, you know, in Los Angeles that night, I, you know, I was with my dad when he died. And the, it's, you know, it just is, it's too much and they don't want to go into it. So you asked about Eugene Thin Cesar. I, I got in contact with him and this was like three years ago. And I said, will you talk to me? He's in the Philippines. And I said, and he said, uh, he said that through an intermediary, he said that uh, he would, that I had to pay him $10,000. Mother. So I said, okay, I'll do that. And I want to interview you on, a, on video. And he said for $10,000. And I was getting ready to leave. And they told me now it's 15000 and then basically the day before I was going to the airport, he said, now it's 25000 So then I said, okay, this is... A setup. Yeah. Yeah, he's so going to string you along. Yeah. So then he died uh, about a year ago. Of? Who knows? It's very hard to find out. Attempting anything because it's in the Philippines. Wow. wow. And he fled to the Philippines immediately after? Not immediately. You know, he, he's kind of got an interesting background besides... Being a, um, you know, having this high intelligence classification at a series of military, con of the top military contractors. And if you're, you know, those military contractors, a lot of people who work for them are CIA. So you have to, sign, they're either CIA assets or agents. You have to sign, to, in order to work there, in order to get the classification, you have to sign a state secrecy agreement, which makes you basically a lifetime CIA asset. And so, and he identified himself. There's a writer called Lisa Pease who really did a deep dive into him. And at one point, he identified himself as a CIA agent, and that's in her book. And uh, so I, uh, I, uh, he also was extremely right wing, and he, independent of any intelligence um, connections that he had. He hated my father because he thought if my father was elected president, he was going to put the blacks in charge of our country. Was that his plan? He, yeah, that was. That was. <laughs> I could finally come clean about that. <laughs> I knew I liked that guy. <laughs> it's between you and me. <laughs> it's just remarkable, man. Wow. It's just... <laughs> yeah, I mean, 
It's a lot to digest. We need to have the we need to have the uh, three day deep dive yes. on your uncle. Yes. When, when well, you, might... you read that book. Oh, yeah, I'm going to no, check it out. That's a really good book. And then the other one by Talbot, you said by was... David Talbot. Yeah. David Talbot wrote two fantastic books. Yeah. One about my my father and uncle and the CIA. But the one that you should read is Devil's Chessboard, mm -hmm. yeah. at least first, and that is about just this biography of uh, of Dulles. And if you want to talk about, like, you know, like, uh, you know, a super villain, yeah, you know, Lex Luthor, mm, that's that's the guy. Wow. <laughs> when you when you met with Sirhan, that in prison, did you? I, uh, this is the man that allegedly killed your father. That's what yeah. the, the record says. Did you feel? Oh, he was definitely involved in the ambush. Did you feel he was guilty when you met him? Did you feel like he was remorseful? What did you feel like his energy was? Well, first of all, he's a very gentle soul, right? He was very humble, and he and um, he cried, you know, and he and he also said. He cried and he held both my hands and he just and put my hands to his forehead and say thank you, thank you for coming here. Every time I saw your your mom on TV with all of you guys, I would it would make me cry. So you know he was. Uh, um, it was it was an interesting conversation. You know he had a fascination. He he came from Palestine. Incidentally. You know when when he when the 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 murder my dad was killed, he was facing the death penalty, and my family all signed a letter to Judge Walker saying, "Please don't give him the death penalty." Hmm. And then I think three years later, my brother Joe was hijacked. He was uh, he he was on a plane coming back from Pakistan. And Palestinians, uh, Black September group, hijacked the plane, and they tried to land in Amman and Jordan, and they, the Jordan, Jordan, <coughs> King Hussein wouldn't let them. And so then they landed in the desert in Yemen, and they demanded the release of Sirhan initially, and then they they blew up the plane and burned it, but they ultimately release my brother. Um, but, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I feel like um, uh, people deserve justice no matter who they are. Yeah. And, you know, and sir, and, you know, I, I, I'm curious about what happened with my dad. And you know, Sirhan was just—he was—he was interesting. It was very, very interesting. He, you know, he came over here as a refugee, and really had nothing. But he was—he loved horses from when he was little. He never was on a horse. The only time he was on a horse was that time they put him on a horse. But he became a horse walker at this track. But you weren't mad because, like, you know, he was involved in the plot. You know, I. Um, I, I, I try to forgive people, mm. and <coughs> I, you know, Sir Ann, for a couple of reasons, Sir Ann was in jail for six years. I don't think anger or resentments are a good thing. I think that they're corrosive to your soul. And I think, you know, having anger, or resentment, carrying that around against another human being is like, swallowing poison and hoping someone else will die. Mm. And you're letting other people live in your head rent free and you're giving them power over your life. So, you know, the best way to escape from, you know, that kind of corrosive force is to pray for people and forgive them. And so I don't, yeah, I don't uh, carry resentments or anger toward him. Mm. And, um, but also I don't believe that his bullets killed my dad. Yeah. Uh, and I think if my dad were around, my dad really, um, you know, the arc of all his whole career was toward justice. And, you know, there's a little brown guy in jail who didn't get a proper trial for 60 years. And I think my father would at least, you know, would not like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Best book on your granddad? 
Uh, well, I think the book I wrote, which is American Values, is the best thing to read about my grandpa. And there's a chapter on him in there that answers a lot of these questions. And it's easier, it's easy to read. And um, it's the first, I think it's the first chapter in the book. Um, the, 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 the major work that's been done on my grandfather, that is, the, you know, the kind of the definitive, if you want to read a big yeah. research, it's called The Patriarch. Yeah, I have, yeah. 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 Um, hmm. do, and do you think that's but also, no, Sorry, just do you think it's a fair take on him, or do you think that I think it's, it's pretty fair. I, you know, I don't like it completely, but it does exonerate him from being a bootlegger. Got you. Okay. You know, it doesn't... He didn't know... Uh, what's his name, David, uh, the guy who wrote the book. He's written a few of these. Uh, yeah, uh, he didn't, you know, he was not, uh, as I think he missed a lot, of, a big part of the story because he was not aware of uh, the bad feelings, you know, between my family and, and the CIA. He, he knew the incidences, but he didn't know what was happening in the agency. Yeah, wow. So through everything that you've been through, all the trauma that you faced as a kid, experiencing all these horrible events, you still have a desire to serve the American people and to wake up every day, whether it's through environmentalism, whether it's through, you know, politics. Do you ever get the feeling of just giving up? Do you ever just say, you know what, no, I, fuck, I don't. fuck all this, I'm, I'm, <laughs> no. not, I'm not dealing with this. What <laughs> no. all these people say, I'm smeared by the media, just go to hell with all of it. Do you ever feel that? No, I don't, because, you know, what are we here for, right? I mean, it's not just a make a big pile for ourselves and whoever dies with the most stuff wins. You know, there's got to be a, uh, you know, uh, th there's got to be a reason. I think anything that is worthwhile is you have to struggle for. I mean, I look back, I read a lot of history and everybody that I've admired throughout human history, whether it's, you know, Alexander the Great and to Magellan, to, you know, they've all been through a struggle where they were disavowed by everybody that they knew and where they had to kind of walk through a valley of death where they were completely alone. And, you know, that is one of the things that made their lives worthwhile. All the incoming flack that I get, you know, I try to look at that as a gift and say, you know, the harder this is, uh, you know, the more important it is. And, and if you look at it that way, you can change your attitude towards it. Uh, you don't ever feel um, oppressed by it. I, I think that the most paralyzing thing that people, um, that really disables a lot of people is a sense of victimization and self-pity. Hmm. And that, um, you know, I when I, I got sober 40 years ago, but at one point I, I said, um, I was, uh, I heard myself complaining about something <laughs> And I thought, you know, that's kind of a natural reaction for me that if somebody asks me, how are you doing, that I'll share some, you know, bad thing that happened to me recently or something. So I said, I'm going to experiment, which is not complaining about anything for Lent. And it was right at the beginning of Ash Wednesday. I went uh, for 40 days and I just didn't complain. So if somebody asks me, how are you doing, I always say, great. And then what I would do, because I don't want to lie, I'd say, well, why am I feeling great? Mm. I'm feeling great because I'm an American at a time in history when most of the people in this country live like gods compared to every other, other person in history. I, I live at a time when there's antibiotics. I'd be dead if it weren't for antibiotics. Um, there, I can get orange juice whenever I want it. <laughs> I can get, you know, there's glass in front of me when I drive so the bugs don't come in my eyes. And I think of all these like little things that, okay, I'm grateful for it. And then I make that list and I, I feel differently about life. I'm processing life differently, processing experience differently in a way that lifts my mood and makes me feel grateful. And gratitude ultimately is a choice, you know. So at the end of 40 days, I just said, this is really working for me. And so since then, I've never ever complained about anything in my life, nothing. And uh, I have my son Connor, when I was about, uh, when he was, I don't know, he was like 14 years old. And he said to me, hey, dad, how come I've never heard you complain about anything? And I said to him, 
it's actually not a natal impulse for me. My, you know, my atavistic impulse is to complain about a lot of stuff. And I told him the story that I, you know, that I just made a decision and that it really worked out for me. And after that, I never heard him complain in his whole life. And he's went through a lot of like nightmare stuff. And, but everybody loves him because he just has a buoyant attitude and never complains about anything. So I think it's, I recommend it. I think it's a, a really good way to live your life and to forgive people who, you know, who wrong you. And I've had people do things where I could walk around with justified anger. Mm -hmm. If I want, I have things that I could justify if I wanted to be, if I let myself be angry. You're giving other people control of your mind and, you know, um, over, your, over your day. And uh, um, So but, when it comes to complaints, it's about personal situations. Like, obviously, you have gripes with the American system and you have the gripes with government and you feel comfortable pushing back against those things. Oh, but yeah, I'm going to criticize if I see yeah. something wrong. Yeah. And I'm not going to say, look what they're doing to me. You know, they're right. treating me unfairly. It's not about you. It's about yeah. something bigger than yourself. Yeah. Uh, listen, we, we've been uh, informed that you have a busy day. Obviously, you're running for president. You've got other things to do than hang out with us and tell us awesome stories. But I just want to say thank you so it's much for awesome. coming on the show. It's yeah, been absolutely you, amazing. Yeah, thank you, guys. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just really cool. Just great to hear your perspective on all these things. And it's great to hear... Yeah, I wish you the best of luck, man. I really do yeah, wish you the best of luck. Absolutely. It's cool. This is Thank really you, awesome. Andrew. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen in this election. You know, I don't even know if Biden's running. I don't know what's going on. I, I, genuinely, the two people, you have Trump and you have Biden, right? I don't know if Biden makes it to the election, and I don't know if they'll allow Trump to do it. So you might be president yeah. by default. <laughs> this is a very That's realistic. my only issue with you. I wish you were like 95 years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah we yeah, need yeah. you to be a little I wish old. you were a little old. That's kind of what I look for in a president. 100, 100 yeah. years old. Anyway, so uh, please tell them, I know that they can go to kennedy24.com if they want to support your campaign, if they want to learn more about you. Obviously, you've got tons of books that we've mentioned here. We'll put some links in, but is there anything else that you want to tell the people? Uh, kennedy24.com, we have to get on. We have to get uh, almost a million signatures to get on the ballot in 50 states. So whether you whether you uh, are going to vote for me or not, it's good for democracy. To I agree. Get a I'm going to put my signature on there today. Yeah. Thank like you. When are you dropping your sneakers? Oh yeah, Trump got a sneaker. <laughs> you, need a sneaker. you need a nice boat shoe, a Kennedy yeah. boat shoe. Ooh. Kennedy Ooh. boat shoe would be flames. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah topsider, dude. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> I need to get on that. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you so much, man. That's our page. Thank you. Thank you.